dire wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know, empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Welcome, everybody. It's that time again. We're about to lay down the law. We're about to go hard up in here, and that's because a lot of people have upped their game. They kicked it up a notch. The religious realm of YouTube is rife with reaction videos, debates, discussions. And now, uh, for whatever reason, uh, Islam seems to be at the center of that, as all you guys probably know. There was a recent discussion between Muhammad Hijab and Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pajot. And at the same time, there was a separate discussion that Muhammad Hijab had with Andrew Tate over his decision to become Orthodox, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> to become Muslim. We're going to be covering both of those uh, topics today. And I have my esteemed guests from Orthodox Shahada and David, the real Medway, or David Erhan, as you guys know from his channel. Uh, we'll let everybody give a brief introduction. And then we will get right into the material. We wanted to do our reaction, critique, and response. Everybody's doing reaction videos. That's the hot thing for the last year or two. So we're going to be doing our reaction and analysis videos. Uh, and we're going to be cl playing clips. We're not going to play the entire thing. We're going to play the uh, relevant clips from both of these discussions. And we're going to take turns uh, kind of chiming in and giving our critiques. So... Uh, Orthodox Shahada, what's up? You guys want to tell us about you, what you do, and your channel, and then we'll go to David, and then we'll get started. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having us on. Really great to be here again. I'm Kai. Um, I'm one half of the prosopic union, shall I say, of Orthodox Shahada. Uh, we do our apologetics towards Islam um, from an Orthodox perspective, and we try to cover all sorts of different um, ways of doing that, whether it's like historical, um, metaphysics, philosophy, fic, um, and that's about it. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm David Arhan. Uh, my channel generally is focused on Orthodox Christian theology, specifically historical patristic theology, uh, particularly between the 4th and 7th centuries, although uh, I still go into other centuries and other contemporary issues that people still discuss today. So I like to go to the primary sources and the secondary sources and uh, kind of synthesize various different books and theological views of various different patristic figures into kind of a unified um, manifestation of Orthodox Christian theology as it is manifested in the liturgy. So I kind of do presentations and occasionally I do political videos. And so, and kind of as a personal information, um, I am a, you know, I'm a Turkish person, but I'm an Orthodox Christian as well. So I, I will say in a cultural sense, in, in that proximity sense, I have some knowledge of Islam in that capacity as well. Not like actually Kai and, uh, you know, the crew at Orthodox Shahada, but, you know, I, have, I know a couple of tricks myself. So glad to see all of you here. All right, and also Lewis is here as well, uh, representing Orthodox Shahada. Yeah, right. What's I up, am Lewis? here, and I am the other half of Orthodox Shahada. I like to look at late antique metaphysics, philosophy, Christian theology, history, all the same kind of stuff um, that David does, just from a different angle, uh, namely for talking to Muslims, and that's it. 
All right, let's get into it. So uh, I think Lewis and David had some areas in the first uh, chunk of the Peterson hijab discussion that they wanted to comment on. Uh, most of my critique will be from the 40 minute uh, point onward. Um, David, is there any, a clip that you wanted me to play in this first uh, 40 minutes or did you just yes. want to reference? Uh, yes. So uh, the first, I will say, I, I suppose the first 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I think we have a general agreement that uh, they don't really dive too much deep. So they're kind of like, they talk about topics that are more interesting to people who are into the history of things, right? So for example, how different cultures interact with each other historically, uh, things like, you know, religious uh, warfare and things like that, things like liberalism and its failure or, or whether it has it is successful or, or such. So I think there is a common agreement, particularly in minute eight, uh, 37, uh, where, uh, oh, actually, yeah, but eight minute eight, uh, 37, uh, Jordan Peterson starts talking about a point that we see very often, which is, uh, if basically that a lot of religions have common grounds and there's a common problem, right? Postmodern liberalism, whether you want to call it or not. And so it makes more sense in Peterson's perspective, that's the way he's trying to explain it, for these different religions, not even to settle their differences, but to kind of understand the larger pro problem. And he kind of makes the argument that, well, there's many things that religions have in common. And Jay, maybe you can play the clip as well to kind of showcase that. Yeah what exactly he's saying because it's kind of relevant to what i'm trying to get at right. so so, um, you, so about how long i'm going to start at where and about how yes. long uh minutes 8 37 um okay i'll tell you when to stop I okay suppose. here we go globally speaking that it would be useful for people of religious faith to note that there are other people of religious faith with whom they have much in common one of them being religious faith and that they are also confronting as people of religious faith a world that is attempting to let's say shake itself free of that and so it isn't exactly obvious to me that it's a great time for people of religious faith to concentrate on their differences given that there are perhaps more important elephants to address let's say or fish to fry and so i've been trying to i'm very ignorant about the islamic tradition. so i guess we can stop here because that kind of gets into yeah so uh the the main problem that i see with peterson's argument is he's kind of just saying well religions have commonalities and he's kind of basically pointing out the obvious that religions are religions and what i mean by that is that what religions are inherently about is answering the metaphysical questions in regards to the grounding of ethics the grounding of reality the grounding of objectivity and so various different religions might have common ground on that, as he himself says, it's because they are religious faith. But uh, the main issue that I see personally is that, as a matter of fact, a religious faith with wrong ideas can lead to wrong conclusions. And so one can counter Peterson's argument by saying, well, what? Well, maybe it is whatever religious faith that has caused this monster of postmodern liberalism to occur in the first place so isn't it a better idea to kind of actually get into the deep aspect of you know where that problem comes from and that's kind of one of the things that i try to do in my channel and i i'm not going to try to give a you know very long argument on why i think it is the case i'm going to try to keep it simple but um in in the religious worldview we understand that you know, calling into question foundational texts, unless there's a, you know, super, super good reason, right, which will still undermine the faith itself, uh, just casually calling into question important aspects of the faith is pretty much basically calling the faith into question itself. So for example, if the creed can be called into question, if the scriptures can be called into question, if the traditions of the church can be called into question as, as a Christian of that church, then you're basically calling your own faith into question. As a matter of fact, in modern Western, I suppose, you know, Christianity, this is very commonplace. And I think ultimately the roots start somewhere in the Protestant Reformation, and maybe even the Renaissance, and maybe even before that, uh, with the with the debates regarding you know how we should understand for example the term filioque in the creed again this gets very deep into that 
question, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. But I hope I made my point clear that, in fact, perhaps the source of the problem that is at hand is, you know, by looking into the religious differences in the first place. That's kind of what I wanted to point out. If you guys have any, any of the comments, then feel free to do so. Give so. All right. In that case, I, I suppose I can move on with uh, another part that I wanted to mention. This is pretty much a minute 21. I don't think you actually even need to play the clip, but it's a minute 21 of the video where there's a discussion with, on, and again, maybe some people in the audience might not really mind about this discussion, but this is basically about, you know, secular liberalism. And hijab is making, I think, the good point that secular liberal, liberalism is not only new, it, it resulted in various different atrocities, various different wars, various different various casualties um, that should have been avoided. And it's ultimately, I think, logically consistent with the ethos that was brought in with that worldview. Um, as I said, this is a, he starts talking about this minute 21. But then what's strange is that uh, he acts as if he downplays the role of Islam historically. And he's kind of doing this thing that a lot of people like to do where uh, there's this implicit at the very least accusation that Christianity is the source of these things. Now, uh, according to the Encyclopedia of Wars, uh, only 7% of all wars were religious in nature. So that already refutes the lib you know, modern liberal idea that religions cause wars, right? That's a popular talking point, but only 7% of them. But what's even more shocking is that half of them, so 3.23% of total wars, half of the religious wars that were called were called and waged in the name of Islam. So Muhammad Hijab admitted a little bit that, you know, he, his side has something to play, but he really downplayed the, the contribution to this field. And we see this again in modern academia and histor historiography, that people talk about the Crusades as if it's the ultimate form of, you know, Christian bloodshed and you know, hunger for, thirst for war or whatever. But, you know, even prior to that, there were various diff different historical warfare based on Christian lands, actually. So that has not been mentioned. And, and seeing that, you know, Peterson's audience might not perhaps know this historical fact, it might mislead a lot of, I think, well-intentioned people into coming to wrong conclusions about this. Yeah, that's a great point. And shout out to everybody in the audience. We got almost 600 live on this Saturday afternoon. That's awesome. Uh, if you would hit like and share, and uh, let's move on. Did you have? I do have that twenty-one uh, minute clip, but we can move on if you want to do a different one, or if Lewis wants to say anything. Um, well, um, I thought no, it might yeah. be worth bringing up something that I'm. Well, I'll say this first of all, and then Kai can maybe uh, talk a little bit about the the whole fifty percent wars being in the name of Islam and how that's not just a historical kind of accident, that's really something that's kind of baked into the, the Sharia. But it's funny because one of the big sort of critiques of the Byzantine Empire, of the Islamic empires, that, or the, the growing Islamic empires at the time, was that there, for example, Emperor, Emperor Leo IV, he wrote against uh, the Islamic faith, saying like, look, your God delights in war. Um, and the Byzantine Empire was actually, although there was lots of, civil war in the Byzantine Empire, um, from my historical reading, it seems like the Byzantine Empire, even stated by scholars, had a very strong emphasis on defensive warfare. It wasn't so much obsessed with expansionism, but a lot of the wars fought around Justinian's time were taking back parts of the empire that had that they had originally had. So it could be seen more of a civil sense. But yeah, the Byzantines point. were known for having very more, more of a defensive war uh, kind of theology or politic um so i think that's pertinent to mention um, so yeah uh, maybe kai could say something about this so lewis you want me to go into a little bit of the sharia behind yeah this okay yeah so this idea that um offensive jihad or war is baked into islam fundamentally is an undisputable point Okay, so you have among the various schools where you have statements to the effect of um, the engagement of the unbelievers is obligatory, okay, even if they do not commence aggression, okay, and, it, and the citation here is directly the Quran and the Sunnah, so you'll find that, for example, in the classic Hanafi text of Al-Hidayah, 
Okay, you have statements in the Shafi'i books that say um, it's obligatory once every year for Muslims to engage in offensive jihad. Um, peace treaties are to be enacted when Muslims are weak, and the Muslims can break peace treaties if it's to their advantage to then conquer lands. You have all sorts of this kind of stuff um, that is quite apparent within the religious texts of the various schools. And so this notion that Islam is not fundamentally um, expansionary in nature is just nonsense. Muslims yes. know that the that the whole thrust of Islam is to expand. Okay. It is always to expand, to conquer the entire globe under the banner of Islam. The only uh, nuance here is whether or not the Muslims can effectuate or can be effect, um, can be um, effective in waging that campaign. And so there may have to be certain delays at some points in time where they recognize that they're weak, that they have to engage in peace treaties, but then once they can break those peace treaties, they are to do so and they are to continue waging, waging war. And I'd like to just also add that the when it comes to the Crusades, just so we because just because it got brought up, the first several Crusades, and of course we have our criticisms of it as Orthodox, we have problems with things that happened during the Crusades and and whatnot. But the early Crusades were all called in order to retake lands that had previously been already conquered by um, Islamic uh, expansion, right? So um, yeah, I think that's I think that's also pertinent. To mention, yeah, I think a lot of this was uh, a lot of PR and not really dealing with the the issue. I'm talking about from the vantage point of, of hijab. It was trying to package Islam for the West as this very uh, rational, very peaceful, very um, you know enlightened type of religion. And of course, that's not really the case at all. Um, did anybody, David? Did you have anything else in the first uh, forty minutes? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, I think you should definitely play the clip at uh, minute 2257, which I found very interesting, where Peugeot, I think that's the first time Peugeot interjects into the conversation. Are you ready for me to play that clip? Yes. Here we go. These are the kinds of conversations I think we need to have. But on that point, I think, I, I don't want this to be interrogative. And I, I, I just want to interject yeah, please, one please. thing, because I think it's important. I think, Jordan, you're very, you're very kind and... Uh, and I understand, I also watched the message to Muslims and I thought there were some problems with it, definitely. Okay. But when you said there's an elephant in the room that I want to address, my mind immediately went to videos as I've seen of you okay. with, with some of your friends in the street and yeah. suggesting violence and suggesting uh, aggressive actions against other communities, yeah. which in the West is something that, let's say in Canada, people don't do that. And that even though there might be civil conflicts, we have a state, we have police, we have an apparatus, yeah. which is there to do, which is not completely perfect, yeah. but which which is functions to install the rules. So when I see someone in the street with, surrounded by men wearing masks, yes. who are talking about if these other groups come out, you know, they're going to see us and we're going to be there. And I'm okay. looking for Jews and, and we're talking about blood. And there's yeah. this very, these very strange behaviors that yeah. I think uh, that when did I gonna... say we're looking for Jews. Do you remember that when I said that exact statement? I just remember you talking to police about. About Jewish people? Yeah. I'd like to get an exact quote. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't remember. I recall saying. Well, the other remember, one, the yeah. one that I definitely yeah. saw yeah. that that you spoke for quite a while was mm. was was relating to some issues with Hindu. Right, so what happened recently? I don't want to. Yeah, go yeah. yeah I think that should okay, be well, kind of so enough with point. that point. Right. Yeah. So one thing I I want to briefly note before we kind of get to the next part of this is that after that, I one thing I found interesting is uh, from my perspective is. Hopefully I'm not too loud because the microphone thing is popping up. But uh, is after that portion, um, Muhammad Hijab was a bit passive aggressive, kind of like trying to joke around, but kind of like assert some kind of dominance over Peugeot after he made those comments, which I think actually Peugeot's comments do have some merit uh, if you kind of look into the history of this kind of behavior, which um, is very common from these kinds of groups. And you know, to me, it's not a big deal. What is a big deal is that when you make those actions, you then act as if 
the fault is completely on the other side is that I, I find kind of strange because the only reason I'm even talking about this from my own perspective is because, you know, hijab himself is the one who in, engaged the conversation on, you know, historical, you know, fights between different groups and such. So if you're going to be fighting about that, I think that's a valid objection to make. Oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, he brought that up. And then when that was uh, asked of him, he, of course, had to run away from that. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that we should also point out is that um, Mohammed Hijab is uh, someone who is in this conversation because he's managed to give off this impression to Jordan Peterson that he is a, a kind of like a very honorable and valorous individual. But I think if we show exhibit A through whatever, infinite, I don't know, I can't see them on the screen, but I know Jay has them. Um, and he can just kind of cycle yeah let me them. let me get some of these and so this um, these are public right we want to be clear what, yeah these are these were on twitter they don't exist anymore but they were on twitter and they were in youtube uh, so this one says time. this is muhammad hijab saying i believe certain anti-muslim women would wish they lived in the medieval period a period if a war was won by the opposing side it would be conventional that people would be taken as booty historical accounts actually some say some women dress up for their captors <laughs> so uh, right, this is so, the um, this is the guy yeah, that the, just told you about war right that, that uh christianity causes war right yeah i mean uh michaela peterson actually uh there's a clip of her reacting to this exact post and, oh okay i mean the the implication is very obvious that um you know somehow uh, some some women who have a problem with uh islam or you know are apparently desirous of becoming uh, sexual slaves, which is kind of strange from someone who's, you know, talking about uh, you know how peace and whatnot and yeah, how, peace, peace you know, and security. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, and there's 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 more. There's, there's yeah. Let's more get to the next one. So the next one is, uh, let's see, uh, can I uh, suck upon the teat? This is not Taylor Marshall. This is Muhammad Hijab of your wife to make her mahram i don't even know what that means <laughs> what is mahram mahram means permissible so um sorry not permissible it means like to make somebody um basically like a relative in a sense that you can be around them and mm. so if if you were to drink the breast milk of someone then you can be around them because they're no longer um permissible to you in marriage gotcha. and so there's no fear of of you doing anything with them maybe taylor marshall and uh, hijab there could link up on some common ground do a little bit of ecumenism a little bit of mammary based ecumenism there um let's see here's a couple more from if i were oh, increased <laughs> if I were an anxiety-ridden, hate-filled, nihilist atheist like whoever, I would consider suicide uh, as an option. This is because the world of humans is more pain than pleasure, the pain of being a coward, the pain of no purpose. Uh, go find a tall building, uh, I guess as an apostate prophet. I want to give you sincere advice. You should commit suicide, blah, 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 blah. Kill yourself, he keeps saying. So Yeah, I mean, that's that's not a good way to make a point, is it? Well, imagine if Orthodox people or if any of us on our side said anything half as wild as this. I mean, people would be going nuts. Oh, the Ortho bros are dangerous. They're a menace to society. Shut them down. And then when it's these people, oh, no, it's just, you know, it's just that's well, that's their that's their view, bro. Next one is when are all the anti-Muslim attention whore Islamophobes going to get on their knees in intellectual submission? before they are whipped by the freedom of speech in terms of Twitter Muslims, and they reluctantly open their mouth in protestation uh, to find that they have been defiled by truth. You know, it's the, the typical uh, bravado and screaming and screeching that we always hear, uh, which is a replacement for actual argumentation. I just realized that this is apostate prophet's partner, and she is a publicly against Islam. Um, what that one's blacked out lewis what is the context of that one uh i thought i sent one that wasn't blacked out <laughs> oh um, what is it supposed to be let me check and then uh, uh no it's just no 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 i mean i the point there is just that he is attacking someone's spouse oh right? i see i got you okay 
Uh, and uh, then here, here's the other one with a list of kind of crazy statements here. Where you can go play with each other. Get on your knees. Gimp. Uh, DW give you golden shower. DW give you nasty thing. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Over and over and over. Yeah, so... I mean, just kind of gross. Yeah, this was kind of unhinged um, in the live stream between David Wood and Apostate Prophet. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So anyway, those are all his public tweets. So if anybody wants to get mad about it, you can go blame him. Um, And again, imagine if anybody on our side even was half as uh, sassy, sassy. As, the, as those tweets, right? I mean, everybody would just have a meltdown. Oh, call the police. The ortho bros are going unhinged. Oh, right? It would be a meltdown. Uh, anyway, so it's just fu- it's just funny. But it, and it also speaks to the irony of the fact that how often do they criticize us for being mean? And, I mean, this is what we're up against, right? People who act like completely ridiculous goofballs, right? I mean, unhinged, crazy people. We are firm. We are cons- we are we are uh, you know straight up with these people, and that's perceived as being mean. But the response is that we're constantly dealing with we're dealing with unhinged people like this. So everybody, everyone should take this into account. What's next? Yeah. So the next things that I have, I want to kind of go over them quickly until we can get to the, I think the decent part, which is the actual philosophical right. theological part, instead of you know this. I suppose disgusting part, but um, one of the things. Uh, let me let me see. Okay, so Jordan Peterson is asked, "What's the ultimate purpose of life?" And his response is to hopefully trying to make peace. Which, to me, it's kind of. I think that's one of the instances where Jordan doesn't really know what the answer is himself, but he's trying to like, he's trying to give like not the ultimate final purpose, but kind of like, but well, I guess one of the purposes right now, like which. Um, I think, Jay, you can appreciate that the fact that this is kind of a, um, not a good answer. But then he kind of connects this with the fundamental necessity of a uniting book. So it's kind of this sola scriptura understanding where uh, Jordan has where a book is what unites people. But St. Paul says that for the, for the Christian church, the Christian church is the pillar and ground of truth. Yeah. So we actually have a very different view in this regard. And um, it's quite interesting because Hijab himself... Um, criticizes sola fide he criticizes uh he criticizes western original sin but you know peugeot doesn't believe in those ideas well, and at one point yeah what the guilt at one point Tajo says uh well dr peterson has been uh under the influence or, or given his perspective of christianity from a lot of western kind of low-level protestant ideas and so he thinks of it as this propositional book thing and so, you know, to be, to be fair, Pajo does interject uh, and make that point that you're making. I'm not saying you're crit- criticizing Pajo, but he, he does bring that up that, you know, the, the criticism that Jordan had, like when he was 13 of Christianity was, was of this kind of, you know, low tier uh, evangelical Protestant type of idea. Yeah. So I didn't, but that wasn't really discussed a lot, I think is basically kind of like, you know, the point of original sin because it is actually pretty connected to the christian understanding of right. uh, christ's mission uh then they talk about you know the purpose of worship is to unite each other to god i thought it was interesting because although hijab and pajor are in agreement uh, the way they agree with each other is distinct so for, so for orthodoxy we believe in the doctrine of theosis which is uniting with god through god's grace and becoming like god in the measure in a similar measure that god has become like man and, and that this is our ultimate understanding of salvation, whereas in Islam, you don't really have such an idea like that. Uh, it is more so just kind of like this external reward where you enjoy the pleasures of life. And whereas for us, it's kind of like going even more deeper in the base of the pleasure itself. It's kind of like the distinction between having this bottle of water and drinking from the source of the river itself. Or our understanding of salvation is kind of like drinking from the source itself, which is being united with God himself. Um, and, and and I think Peterson kind of calls out with the previously talked about things where he kind of says, if you focus on who did this, who did what arguments, then everyone's going to get to the point where everyone becomes irrede- irredeemable, which is actually a good point because, I mean, isn't that kind of the reality of sin where if we, in, you know, if we examine ourselves enough, we will understand that all of us are, you know, all of us are unjustifiable before God in that sense. 
And so this kind of bears the necessity of the redemption of our sins and becoming healed uh, from our sins, which, you know, the incarnation and the crucifixion of Christ is kind of entirely, not entirely, but pretty much in the main theme about that. It's the healing of human nature right. by Christ's assumption of human nature in its totality. Yeah, there's and, not really any notion of an actual ontological transformation that occurs. It's more of uh, just uh, just do good, bro, right? Yeah, pretty much. And that's pretty. That's all that I want to cover prior to minute 51, which is where the arguments against the Trinity and Christology is being made. We just kind of make, making this, you know, how can one God be three persons kind of argument. So if you guys don't, you know, we can move on to that part unless you guys have some other comments that you want to make prior to minute 51. To, to be fair, David, I don't think we need to go into the specifics of the arguments uh, for the Trinity. We've done like so many hours of that. We may as well just talk about other stuff while we can, if you know what I mean. I mean, we can just refer people to those videos. If you disagree, feel free. Well, to I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll put in the chat right Sorry. now for people who want more extensive lectures on uh, Trinitarian theology, the problem of the one and the many in regard to the Trinity. I've done many talks on that uh, at Orthodox Shahada. They've interviewed Dr. Bo Branson, who's done many talks on that as well. David has many talks on the Trinity. So all of our channels go into a lot of depth about addressing that specific question of whether the Trinity, quote, makes sense. Uh, you know, I've, again, I've probably done 50 hours of lectures on that uh, as well as everybody else here. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go to the next clip you guys want to cover. Uh, okay, I guess I'll continue. Uh, so. The next clip that I have, well, that this is kind of the last clip that I had. I've thought it was very strange. This is in one hour, 10 minutes, uh, uh, 35 seconds, where hijab is talking about the tradition of biblical hermeneutics. <clears throat> yeah, now I have a lot on this area, so we can skip mm -hmm. back and do some more of these. But is that the last clip that you have on this discussion or? Yes, that's the last okay. one I have. All right, so I've got quite a bit. So uh, here's David's clip on 110. Let's see, let's see what they're saying. Or encompassing. It's like, stop asking me if I believe in God. Watch me. Yeah, yeah. okay. No, but I get what you're saying. But what I'm saying is this, is that the attitude that you have towards scienti scientific investigation is that which is more congruent with a correspondence theory type understanding. Yes. Right? So you, you, you simply ask the question that, by the way, the Quran asks, and one of the questions, central questions the Quran asks us to ask uh, Christians and Jews is Bring your evidence if you're truthful. This is the central question that Muslims are asked to ask. The same question that you as a scientist ask, we have to ask as well, right? And I'm using the word ask a lot here. What I'm saying is, this is where the cognitive dissonance may come in. I'm not it saying does, it does come yeah. in. So, uh, that is part of what's to torn the West apart on say, on the basis of the Enlightenment versus the religious tradition, to and the degree that that's a conflict. Just to add to this point is, for example, going back to Origin of Alexandria, yeah? Origin of Alexandria, because he has this hermeneutical dilemma. He has a hermeneutical dilemma, right? He doesn't know what to do with what verse. Is he going to spiritualize it, metaphorize it, or is he not going to do that? He was asked by an apologist called Celsus. He said, what do you say of the crucifixion? And he responds to, the effect, to, to an effect to say that not everything was true, what happened right, in the crucifixion. The point is, is that when you open the can of worms of hermeneutical spiritualization or uh, exegetical or, you know, uh, metaphorization, yeah? When you open that can of worms, what is left of Christianity is basically mythological. Now, then I will say, what makes this myth better than any other myth? What's, what, why are we investigating the myth of Christianity and not, for example, the myth of Hercules and Zeus? Why is uh, the figure of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit more important to me than the Mithraic, uh, what do you call it, Trinity? Yeah, well, that's a postmodern question. And, and you can take that even farther and say, well, the clip kind of why ends there. this? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, the, uh, Jay, you can get into this more because this is more your field. But from the brief, from the reading that I have when it comes to Alexandrian hermeneutics, uh, hijab is maybe he's talk maybe origin might believe this, but Alexandrian hermeneutics is not necessarily dialectically opposed, uh, uh, pits an opposition between the spiritual reading and the literal reading. Uh, St. Kirill of Alexandria, who's part of this understanding, uh, if you read his Glafira on the Pentateuch, he literally starts this, volume one, he starts the book by explaining how the spiritual and allegorical reading is based and has its foundation from the literal reading of the scripture, the literal event. So uh, 
or the origins uh, hermeneutics and reading, even if this representation was true, does not reflect on the church tradition as a whole. And, and so uh, I, I completely disagree with the idea that Christianity somehow allows for uh, the spiritualization of the gospels where we can basically question the legitimacy of historical events. That is right. not necessarily, that's not the Christian patristic view. Yeah, I mean, I would like to comment at this point, and uh, I'll put in the the chat uh, an article from our friend uh, Sarah from Hamilton, who uh, really uh, elucidates this in a very uh, clear way, which is that you know the the classical Orthodox view, which was the same in the West up in, into the Middle Ages, and even in the Latin West, it continued uh, in this way. In fact, it's still even mentioned in the the Catholic Roman Catholic Catechism today, and the Orthodox Church would agree because we find this in a lot of the Eastern and Byzantine theologians too. This is the notion of the quadriga. The quadriga is the idea that the scriptures have a four-tiered sense to them, the first being the historical, the second being the allegorical, the third being the moral, and the fourth being the eschatological, or sometimes called anagogical. And so uh, in regard to um, the purpose of this four-tiered sense, this actually comes out of an older Jewish way that they called pardes of uh, interpreting the scriptures. And hence the name quadriga, the four senses. Now, if we think about uh, the concerns that Muhammad Hijab had, which is that if you allow for there to be a spiritual sense, you then lose the literal and the historical sense. This would be a critique applicable to somebody like Origen, because that's precisely what Origen did, is that he allegorized everything to the extent of ahistoricizing the text and the events described. But if we think about something like Galatians 4, where Paul does an allegory on the basis of the story of Hagar and Sarah, we'll note that the allegory itself presupposes the reality of the historical events. In other words, if Hagar, Abraham, Sarah, if they weren't really historical people doing what they did, then the allegory would lose its meaning, wouldn't even make any sense. And so in this regard, it's important to look to uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria, one of our great saints and church fathers, where he uh, gives us this same principle, and you'll notice that the quadriga is not, uh, this is the principle behind the quadriga. You'll notice that it's not foreign to the church fathers. It's not something invented in the Middle Ages. You'll notice that uh, St. Cyril even uses the text from Galatians to make my point. The apostle wrote this not to reject the historical facts, but to relate the type to the reality. And so the reality here is the historical event, the typological interpretation of describing Hagar and Sarah as allegorical or typological relating to, to the history of the church and fulfilled in Christ is the very argument St. Cyril is making. St. Cyril of Alexandria wrote that one cannot apprehend rightly the scriptures if you attempt to contemplate their spiritual meaning without respect to the historical meaning. Those who reject the historical meaning in the, in, in the God-inspired scriptures as something obsolete or avoiding the ability to apprehend lightly, rightly according to the proper manner the things written in them. For indeed, the spiritual contemplation is both good and profitable. So there's a both-and relationship here, not an either-or. In enlightening the eye of reason especially well, it reveals the wisest things. But whenever some historical events are presented us in the scriptures, then in that instance it is a useful for us to, in, to search into the historical meaning. And that is appropriate in order that the God inspired scripture be revealed as salvific and beneficial to us in every way. And of course, this is very useful when it comes to Old Testament texts. And of course, this is very crucial because Islam does not understand and doesn't really have any place for typological exegesis or the fulfillment of historical events, names, people, uh, rituals in the person and actions of Christ. And this is precisely why. They don't understand the animal sacrifices, the temple, and all of that being fulfilled in the work of Christ, which we stress all the time, which is itself a prophetic proof. In other words, typology is prophetic. It has a prophetic element, which helps us to understand the inspiration of the Old Testament. That's precisely the argument that St. Cyril of Alexandria made right there. I would also add that in terms of other later uh, Orthodox Church Fathers, and uh, Jonathan Pajot has actually argued, or, excuse me, has interviewed uh, Father Maximus Constance, well, the Maximus, uh, in his introduction essay, is a scholarly essay that's an introduction to uh, St. Maximus' famous text, uh, Athalasios. He has a lengthy discussion <clears throat> about how, for St. Maximus also, one of the most important church fathers for the Orthodox, 
there was not a sacrificing of the literal grammatical historical context for the sake of the spiritual and the allegorical. In fact, he even points to the four senses. This gets into this on page 47 of, of this text, going into how St. Maximus saw that you could not have the allegorical without, without also having uh, the literal being the grounding for, the, for that. In fact, even Aquinas speaks of this. There's a section, I think, in the Summa where he talks about the allegorical being grounded in the historical. And uh, if you want a scholar uh, who was a Roman Catholic, even, who was uh, amenable to a lot of uh, Orthodox ideas, uh, there's a famous Roman Catholic scholar, Henri de Lubac. And Henri de Lubac has a whole uh, series on medieval exegesis pointing out how this was totally the norm across the glo uh, across the, the Christian uh, sphere, both Byzantium and the West uh, back at that time. So th this is all very well established from a scholarly vantage point as to how we do exegesis. You'll notice that most of the apostles in the New Testament, when they do exegesis of the Old Testament, they give it a typological, Christological, or even an ecclesiological fulfillment and sense. And so this is very crucial to, to Christianity. It's a big, big uh, key to understanding, especially the, the totality of patristic exegesis and hermeneutics of the Old Testament, right? So the, the church fathers are following in the footsteps of the apostles who consistently do their exegesis in a Christological way. And so we know that that's crucial to Christianity as a whole. And that's why many uh, heretics, Theodore of Mopsuestia, uh, people out of the uh, Nestorian and Antiochian schools that were condemned. They were condemned because they only had the grammatical, historical, and literal sense. Later on, at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, there's a four-page lengthy condemnation of the theology of Origen, precisely because Origen only had the allegorical and sacrificed the historical and the literal. Both of these are extremes. Both of these are wrong and are clearly condemned in the ecumenical councils of the Orthodox Church. This is something that was received even into the Latin tradition, the Western Church as well. So uh, neither side in this discussion, I'm not critiquing Pajot, but I'm saying that you know Pajot didn't really get to speak a lot at this point. Really, it was uh, Peterson uh, asking questions to Hijab, Hijab asking questions about the historical event of the crucifixion, the historical events of Genesis, which, by the way, the New Testament presupposes and argues as if the events and people in Genesis were historical. Hebrews 11 speaks as if all of those patriarchs in the Old Testament are precisely models for our faith because they were historical events and people. And so for the problem, in my view, on, the, on Peterson's point is that he is picking one of these elements, the moral sense, which is one of those four senses, and he's saying that, well, the only thing that matters for everybody at all times is the moral sense. And because the moral sense applies at all times, he says that the events in the Old Testament, like Cain and Abel and these stories, he says they happen for all times and at all times. Well, no, no, no. The event doesn't happen at all times, right? That was a temporal event. So we can't say the event was eternal. It's temporal. That would be to confuse the created and the uncreated. But it is also the case that, yes, there is an application of the moral sense of the text to everybody at, in, in, at all times. Absolutely, right? So, yes, the, the story of Cain and Abel, right? That's a brother hate, uh, brother love situation that applies to everybody at all times. But that doesn't mean the event is eternal. And that was something obfusc obfuscated uh, when uh, Peterson was asked that. Yeah, and another example that we can add to this list here, Jay, I'll... Um... Is this one here? The Life of Moses by St. Gregory of Nyssa. Oh, yeah. Cappadocian. And so this is basically without in any way negating the historicity of the life of Moses and the Exodus. The idea here is just to present basically how we can take that real life event in a spiritual context, how we can demonstrate um, the trials and tribulations that Moses went through and whatnot and apply that to our spiritual progress. And just completely allegorizing yeah. the story without negating. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, without negating the historicity. I'm just saying how the uh, this is a complementary approach, and we do see it early on in the Church Fathers. Um, Saint Gregory of Nyssa is uh, fourth century, um, and it's just, it's really early on in our tradition. And nobody accuses Saint Gregory of Nyssa as denying the historicity of these events that he has chosen to give a a supplementary exegesis to. 
Yeah, and of course, you know, even you know, Saint Gregory Nessa being the most uh, uh, allegor- allegorically friendly of the the Cappadocians, uh, even he doesn't sacrifice, you know, the historicity of the text. And of course, that's part of the reason why Origen is condemned in the letter of Saint Sophronius to the Sixth Council. Uh, another couple of examples that I'll add too is that you know, in the New Testament, we have the usage of the Greek word tupos or type. For example, in Hebrews, we're told that Moses went up on the mountain. And he received the types of the things in heaven. And then he put that into the worship. In other words, the temple and the tabernacle are based on, or they're patterned on, they're types of the worship in heaven. And so this wouldn't make sense in terms of the the word typology if there was not a real correspondence to what it was based on, right? In other words, if we can... we, if we can remove from reality something that's a type, that would undercut the notion of heaven in that in that text, because Moses is putting into place a liturgy on the basis of the types in heaven. So in other words, that would actually, if people want to over-allegorize and, and get rid of the history of it, that would undercut the very argument of Hebrews on the, on the in, in regard to types in heaven. Secondly, think about other places where Paul, I think it's in Corinthians, uses the word tupos, typos, type, to describe the events uh, in regard to baptism, he says that when Moses and, uh, took the Israelites through the to, through the waters and then it drowned Pharaoh and his soldiers, he says this is a type tupos of our water baptism. Nothing in that would make any sense if the story of the Israelites, you know, if there wasn't real water, if there wasn't a real Exodus, right? It, it loses all of its sense. And so there's two extremes here, and the church, you know, has classically identified both of these uh, uh, grammatical historical extreme on the one hand. By the way, that's an error that came back up in Protestantism. So again, ironically, if you, you may guys remember, I've, I've mentioned this in the last couple streams, Martin Luther had a debate with Johann Eck, uh, the famous Catholic of his day, and one of the points of contention was over the fact that Luther was really railing against a lot of Old Testament texts, a lot of her, uh, a Christological and typological exegesis. Uh, now he wasn't; a, he didn't go as far as uh, Calvin and other uh, later reformers did in terms of uh, stressing the grammatical historical. But Johann X says you have sacrificed the spirit for the letter, and that's a, 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 a recurring mistake in the Protestants. And that's something that Pajot actually brought up in this discussion when this comes up. He says, "No, actually, Peterson is influenced by that uh, stressing of the letter to the ex- to the." Uh, to the loss of the spiritual. And so what we need is both of these. Just think about Christ's uh, two natures, right? And some of the church fathers compare this, right? There's an external sense to the text, which corresponds to like Christ's physical, uh, you know, human nature, his body, etc. And then there's an inner spiritual meaning of the text corresponding to the divinity. So again, we can't lose either of these. If we lost either of these, then this model of synergy and balance that we see in the incarnation would be undone. I just wanted to say, just on the point of historicity, I think that, say, if if I could speak to, like, let's say I could speak to Peterson, I would just suggest that he actually look into the historical evidence uh, for, say, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And there's plenty of kind of really good scholars on this, like both, um, you know, Orthodox and non-Orthodox. You have, like, people like... Um, well, these are all going to be non-Orthodox, I'm going to list, but these are the ones I know of just off the top of my head. You have, like... Brant Petre, Lydia McGrew, N.T. Wright, Balcom, Hurtado, um, Blomberg, and these are all like going to have relative degrees of agreement with us and stuff. But the they all advance a historical basis, uh, you know, ev- evidence for the crucifixion and the resurrection, which I, I think Peterson could do with looking into. And by the way, if any of that's true, it totally just dis- disproves Islam anyway. So. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, so do we want to move on to the more to more of the clips to critique? Or uh, I had a question for you guys, especially um, maybe Kai or Lewis, who might know more about this from a, a historical vantage point. There, one of the first things that caught my attention was when Hijab says that uh, you can go to Egypt and the Coptic people uh, are uh, totally living in peace with Muslims and that's cool. There may have been some beef in the past, but see, we're a, a religion of peace because uh, because there's Coptics in Egypt. What 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 do we make of this argument? 
This was at yeah. 42 minutes. I'm not going to play the whole yeah. thing. But... So I would just basically say, go and ask the families of the cops who've had their daughters kidnapped by Muslims, enslaved, and there's no way that they can get them back. Just go and ask them if they're living in peace with their Muslim neighbors. Go and ask the cops if they're living in peace with Muslims who come and burn down their churches and say, oh, it was just kind of like an electrical outlet that caught on fire or something like that. Okay, this is just nonsense. The well, fact it's like that... clockwork every Easter. There's, an ex there's a bombing in a Coptic church in Egypt. Yeah, the fact that cops exist does not mean that they coexist yeah. peacefully with Muslims. Right. I mean, that's yeah. nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. You have examples of um, where a person cannot hail a cab if the cab driver visibly sees that they're Christian, for example. They'll just keep driving by. I mean, that's not a violence, so that's not um, anything to write home about necessarily, but it's just these kinds of things on a daily basis coupled with the extreme violence that they do suffer persecution but even just them living as subordinates in that society it's it's very apparent i mean this is not uh, this is basically dimitude if you will even if they may not be even if the muslims or the state may not be collecting jizya the notion of dimitude and subordination and second class citizenry is very apparent um and so this is just nonsense what hijab if he's trying to portray it as if Muslims and Christians live peacefully in Egypt. Sorry, not going to cut it. Yeah, the next point uh, that they get to in the discussion regards the uh, you know J Jordan Peterson sort of set the the stage for the for the discussion to be about uh, how can we dialogue to have peace. And I think that later on he gets to this point about logos and that there is this dialogical element to the notion of logos, which is correct. Um, obviously logos is more than that it's not reducible to that but there is this sort of notion of dialogue uh, dia logos right and so he says well can we can we uh, discuss these topics in order to kind of move towards peace and Muhammad Hijab sort of gives the impression that oh yeah of course you know we, we're all about peace that's why he brought up the the cops and how they exist in Egypt. And so, you know, it's not really that there's this uh, warfare element by the way Christians started all the wars he says uh, none of that was true. That was all just baloney. And so I'm curious, um, before we move on, uh, would you guys agree? And this this was my criticism of uh, Dr. Peterson, I think five years ago when I did a video criticizing him. It was it was just simply that, um, and I know Peterson's not uh, recognizing or, or identifying as an Orthodox Christian. I understand that. But my criticism was this, which is, you can't have a classical liberal position, which that's literally, unless Jordan Peterson has moved away from that in recent years, I don't know if he has, but at least what I've always understood Dr. Peterson to, to uh, hold to in terms of an overall philosophy, especially social philosophy, cultural philosophy, is enlightenment classical liberalism. And that cannot stand up against the uh, all-encompassing theocratic theology of, of Islam. Now, maybe you think classical liberalism is true. I don't think it's true overall. There's insights there. I don't want to get too deep into the philosophy, political philosophy. But the point is that classical liberalism um, starts with the presuppositions of kind of enlightenment, material, enlightenment materialism, uh, evidentialism, um, empiricism. I mean, all of these things are bound up with in, in, in enlightenment ideas uh, uh, of classical liberalism. And if... if God exists. If God has a you know, notion, if we have a notion of God as king, as sovereign, as king of kings, right, in, in terms of Christ, there's not really areas of life where he doesn't exist. And so there's not areas of life where there's neutrality, where, uh, oh, that's uh, secular. And so you can do whatever you want there. And then the religious realm is pious. No, actually, all areas of life uh, are under that dominion. There's different spheres, right? This is the Byzantine idea of the two-headed eagle. But there's not an area of life that that we can be atheist. Oh, uh, in civic life, we're atheists, but privately, we're Christians. This is an enlightenment idea. And I think Jordan Peterson, being a person of the West and of Western thought, Western ideas, he sort of defaults to this as if that's a, a, a thing to champion Western freedom, Western liberalism against sort of tyrannical theocratic regimes. And at a presuppositional level, 
he's not realizing that his notion or that that God proper theology proper does not give place for neutrality and atheism in the civic sphere. And that's precisely the, the, the presuppositions of enlightenment philosophy and materialism, because they subordinate the trans, the transcendental in enlightenment philosophy, the transcendent to the here and the now, right? That's why we get social contract theory. That's why we get anti-monarchical arguments. We get anti-church arguments, anti-theology, anti-metaphysics arguments, all coming out of the middle eight or the enlightenment philosophers, because they want classical liberalism to, to replace ancient and medieval philosophy and systems. And there were, there were valid critiques, right? But if Christ is king, and he is, then we have to admit that a classical liberal atheist civic philosophy is not going to mesh or have anything to say to a position which is more consistent just in the point of God having dominion over every area of your life. And this is why, as we in the West, this is a point that we're, I will concede to Tate, right? If we in the West have this milk toast weak version of Christianity, which is really just worthless and not even Christianity at all, which basically says you can do whatever you want in the civic world, in the civic sphere, just let me have my little alcove, uh, my little piety corner over here, and then all of the other degeneracy can run wild, right? That's why Western theology and Christianity is so weak, as well as many other factors. There's the heresies, there's the foundations, funding the liberal seminaries. There's all of this, right? But this is a, a key point that I've consistently, and I still have this criticism, is that Jordan Peterson is going to have to make a decision between classical liberalism and going in the direction of more and more atheist type of stuff, because that's the direction that classical liberalism takes you in. Guess what? That leads to postmodernism, right? Or giving up the classical liberalism and moving more in the direction of a traditional orthodox phronema and paradigm. Yeah, I wanted to say just like with the thumbnail, we know where it has like, we have Jordan Peterson when it says orthodox next to him. Like we're not, I mean, we're not saying he's orthodox, but um, in terms of how he eventually ends up, whatever he ends up choosing to do, I think it's clear that um, he has enough of a understanding of at least some of the four senses of the crucifixion and the resurrection to have um, like really a, a, a deep kind of understanding, moral and transcendental understanding of Christ in that sense. I think he, he, I would say, like I said earlier, I think if he gets the historical, I don't think he'll, he'll have to, I mean, he'll have to be in a very tough spot um, mentally in order to avoid actually becoming Orthodox. But um, he has openly admitted that he attends Orthodox uh, liturgies both with Peugeot and without Peugeot uh, on his right. own. So I think that um, this is indicative of someone who has recognized the beauty of uh, and, and of Christianity, of Christ and uh, orthodoxy. Um, and that's why I think that, I mean, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that he's not going to fall for the kind of uh, uh, begging of hijab to become Muslim. Uh, which happens towards the the later part of the clip. I don't know if you want to talk about that now, if you want to talk about some other stuff. But um, yeah, I think that when you compare the actual beauty of orthodoxy versus uh, Islam, I think that someone with someone like Peterson, yeah. who has this kind of deep kind of appreciation for beauty and transcendental kind of instances of goodness, uh, I think it's just not going to Islam isn't going to cut it for him as a religion. Yeah, let's move on uh because we, if we don't we we I mean I've got a, a, a endless uh critiques and clips that we could uh cover. What's the next thing that you guys want to get to in regard to um the second half of this uh, uh Hijab Peterson discussion here? So I've covered the stuff in regard to um, the hermeneutics and the exegesis, the meaning of the events. Next, I got to the, the 56 minutes in. They, they get into talking about logos. And um, this is where, again, Jordan Peterson is correct to note that there is an application of logos to just general dialogue. There's an application of logos to a universal reason like we see in the Stoics. There's an application of logos uh, perhaps to the inner meanings of things, right? The logi. 
there's also the notion of Logos as the second person of the Godhead, right? And so we have to understand to not be reductionist in any of these words and any of these phrases to only give them one meaning, right? Logos doesn't just mean universal reasoning or inner law or principle of logic. It doesn't just mean dialogical conversation. It also refers to, as this is the biblical use, the second person of the Godhead. Jesus is the Logos, right? John 1 identifies the person of Christ as the Logos. And this is not strictly borrowed from Greek philosophy. This comes out of the Hebrew wisdom tradition, particularly the book of Hebrew or Proverbs, where we notice that wisdom is personified. Wisdom is given this um, sort of uh, persona, which the some of the church fathers will locate uh, in the person of Christ or as a fulfillment in the person of Christ as well. And even uh, I think some of the uh, Islamic traditions as well kind of at times speak of Jesus as this logos, again, which I think is problematic for their Talheed. But um, that was my next clip. I'm not going to go to, we don't have to play the whole clip, but basically Jordan Peterson is just saying that let's have dialogue. That's the meaning of logos. That's one meaning of logos. And maybe we can achieve peace and understanding between Christianity and Islam by logos dialogue. Uh, but one thing that's the crucial point missing here is just as I've critiqued some of the Roman Catholics here, logos is not, uh, ha doesn't have one referent, right? Logos doesn't just mean this general idea. It has specific mm -hmm. reference and specific systems. Mm -hmm. And for the uh, for Christianity, Logos is specifically referring to the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. From all eternity, he's the Logos, incarnate in time and space. And if we understand that, that's the point that we need to get across, right, to the both the Muslim and to Jordan Peterson, is that the crucial issue at the, in, in all of this discussion and debate is, who is the person of Christ? Is he a uh, mere man walking around, pointing us to Allah, or is he the second person of the Godhead, the creator of the world from all eternity, the eternally generated son of the father who fulfills all of these Old Testament prophecies, who is God, right? That's the key issue that both of these figures have to grapple with. And that's why Jesus is such a controversial figure. Yeah, I'd also like to add, you were talking about uh, Christ as the Logos and, and how this idea is from the Old Testament. Uh, not only just Proverbs, for example, Psalm 33, 6, even in the Septuagint, it says that through the word of the Lord, the heavens were solidified and by the breath uh, of his mouth, uh, like he's basically in Psalm 33, we basically see that through the word, which the New Testament in the book of John is rep repeated, that everything was created through the word, who is Christ himself. And so uh, this idea and the Greek term in the Septuagint is logo, right? So this idea is still used, uh, is maintained in the Old Testament itself. So it's not just some Greek idea. It is in fact a very Hebrew idea that everything was created through the logos, the, exactly. the word of God. Yeah, well, that's in Genesis, right? It's in it's in Genesis one, and and John one is playing on Genesis one. And I would add that I did a whole lecture on this second persona throughout the old testament we find the deity of christ the second person not invented in the new testament all throughout the old testament it's even admitted in, in multiple jewish scholarly texts where they try to figure out and debate who is the second persona that's given divine descriptions that's given the name of yahweh all throughout the old testament jesus of course identifies that he is the one who spoke to moses i am that i am i was the one talking moses looked to me abraham looked to me John 5, John 8. So uh, we know that the New Testament is very clear about this. But the problem is that for both Dr. Peterson and for Muhammad Hijab, we're dealing with people who don't have much of, a, of knowledge. I'm not meaning to uh, insult them, but from our vantage point, don't really understand the totality of the text. And that's particularly apparent when Muhammad Hijab goes to Deuteronomy 18. Because as we'll see, when he brings up Deuteronomy 18 about a prophet, he actually misuses the text. It, it, it makes the opposite argument that he makes the text make. Anyway, let's move on. What's next? What do you guys want to? Yeah, I was also only going to add that with the Psalm 33 usage, the, the latter part of the Psalm also says, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, breath in Hebrew is, I think, the word nefesh, which also has the connotation of spirit. So we can also understand that Psalm 33, 6, not only speaks about everything being created through the Lord, but also, um, you know, hosted, so to speak, in a way by the Holy Spirit as well. And this is in various different Old Testament passages, I think, 
uh, St. John Damascus uses various Old Testament passages to talk about the Word and the Spirit in the Old Testament, specifically the Psalms, in his Exposition of Orthodox Faith, Book 1. So that's what I would recommend to those who are watching or interested in this. Yeah, I would add, too, if you look at the life of Elijah, I've written essays on this, you'll notice that it's not Yahweh himself, because we're told that in uh, Jesus says, no man has seen the Father at any time, and yet in the, in the life of the prophets, the voice of the of the Lord appears to the prophets. The word of the Lord appears to them. Isaiah says that the word of the Lord appeared to me, right? Ezekiel says in chapters 1 to, to 10, which I did a whole lecture on, you can go see, you'll find the Trinity present in the first 10 chapters of Ezekiel, right? Father, Son, and Spirit. And the second person is described as one like the Son of Man. Clearest day referencing the Trinity, referencing uh, the father the son and the spirit so this is not a doctrine invented by paul or or jesus uh, or new testament uh, church fathers this is a doctrine derived from the hebrew old testament and the fact that the jews today don't affirm that has nothing to do with whether that's the whether that that is the case or not uh lewis kai do you want to move on to any uh, clips next um well, I'd, I I have a couple other clips, but I, I did want to mention if there's anything else, uh, this kind of desperate attempt uh, at the end. I don't know what the um, timestamp is for it. Maybe David does. But in the end, uh, Muhammad Hijab basically starts asking Peterson, like, would you would you become Muslim if I gave you this evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad? Like, all the prophecies, which, by the way, also contradicts Deuteronomy, because Deuteronomy uh, 18, uh, or at least, uh, can't remember the exact chapter, but it clearly states that even if the prophecies come true, this was, yeah, this was my grounds. point. Of, yeah, you, you that was the very argument I was going to point out. So Muhammad Hijab says that if the prophecy comes true, then it's a true prophet. That's not what Deuteronomy 18 says. Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 specify that even if the prophecies come true he may still be a false prophet if he tells you to follow another god and so muhammad hijab didn't even know that that's actually the argument in deuteronomy 18 yeah so about the uh, and so he he attempts he asks this question and then peterson's just like no but um he kind of like seems confused by the question at first and peugeot has to kind of say well he's asking if you'd become a muslim and then you know ha 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 but that is literally what he's asking uh, he like he wants you to convert to Islam, and um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of weird. Like I I hope that see, I hope that a lot, I hope a lot of Orthodox understand that becoming Orthodox isn't something you can just do. Uh, you know, snap your fingers and it's done, right? You have to actually go through a process, uh, an acid test through the catechumenate, and you know even priests will sometimes test you to see if you're really serious about becoming orthodox we don't go around um i mean there's a difference in evangelism but this is really kind of like cheapening the religion if you go around kind of desperately uh trying to you know please like it's, it's like seeking validation for your religion when people convert you, you kind of hold it up as this you know validation um kind of like a kind of like a desperate girlfriend it's, it's kind of it's kind of off-putting probably is off-putting to peterson um, so yeah, I mean, like, we're not like that where you just say a phrase, you know, you say your shahada and there we go, bam, that's it. Actually, no, it's, it's, uh, it's more complicated than that. You have to go through catechesis. You have to go through a lot of learning before initiation, before you actually get baptized and received into the church. I, I don't know if you guys have any comments on that, but I find it really quite disturbing how it's like, here, just, just sign up quick and then you can like do all the figuring out later i think the more weird part was not just like you know one can interpret that as, in, as him inviting but then he said and this this portion is in uh, uh r1 minute 27 uh second five and he he kind of basically after asking that he starts to like make a bunch of arguments about like, oh look he fulfilled these different prophecies for muhammad full you know he made these correct the quran has these correct prophecies and all of these arguments that he made like just rapid fire it was as if like he was reading from a script and um i think like this this kind of behavior also allows for 
turning religion into some kind of like a buffet list or like, oh, well, a lot of, you know, I, I guess he said a lot of correct things about the future. Um, okay, I'll suddenly accept every single thing about this religion now and I'll just become completely obedient to it. Where It, it kind of just becomes, as Lewis said, where um, it's not really even taken seriously enough. And I, and, and I will say, you know, that's kind of like whether the intention is good or not, uh, the point from my perspective isn't even asking whether his intentions are good or not. I'm willing to concede that Hijab had good intentions there. What I am trying to say is that this is very regular. For example, in my day-to-day -day kind of conversations with you know Muslim friends or you know friends of a friend, uh, it's very oftentimes does get into that where someone even like me gets asked, you know, gets asked this question where like, okay, well, would you become Muslim if you saw like evidence? And it's like like okay but like i can ask the same question too like if, if i showed you irrefutable evidence that this not doesn't make sense like would you stop being a muslim i mean it's like it, it you know i don't have to like make that constant invitation or like just rapid fire bunch well, of propositions yeah. because I mean, this is kind of something that takes a lot of time and effort right. because religion itself is a very complex study and way of life and there's another thing i wanted to point out but that's, that's a that's out of topic so maybe i'll talk about that well i just wanted to point afterwards. out that here's deuteronomy 13 which specifies so you can't just read deuteronomy 18 alone in fact deuteronomy 13 comes first and it specifies if there rises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and this and the sign or wonder comes to pass and he says let's do uh, other theology let's go after some other deities that you have not known you will not listen to that prophet so the argument that he makes is that because Deuteronomy 18 says that if a prophet predicts the future or the sign of wonder comes to pass, then you must follow them because that's an irrefutable evidence. The very book that he cites says that that's not actually irrefutable evidence. It is true that you can have a prophet who uh, says good things but or true things, but uh, you can also have a false prophet who says good things and true things. And so that's why earlier in Deuteronomy, it was clarified that it's more precise than just signs and wonders. Every religion claims signs and wonders. You can't just make signs and wonders the ultimate proof. And that's why so much of Islam, especially, you know, if you look back to the debate that I had with Azra Rashid, they're basically just doing an, an empirical kind of theology, empiricist theology, where it's just, oh, you stack up evidences versus my stack of evidences and see who has more evidences. Now, evidences are, are important, but everybody claims miracles and it's not possible for everybody to go and test in an evidential empirical way everybody's miracle claims. And that's even what Deuteronomy says. And that's why Paul says in Galatians 1, following Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, that anybody who departs from the gospel that we laid down, even if they perform signs, even if they come as an angel, a miraculous event, you don't follow them. Galatians 1. So I'm not, I know Muslims don't care about that. I'm just saying that that's the orthodox principle that we would follow according to Galatians 1, which is, mo which is modeled on Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. And that's why uh, really all of these claims that Muhammad Hijab has about all of these miraculous prophecies of Islam really don't get him anywhere. Uh, another verse I can, I, I guess we can cite is, uh, you will know them by their fruits verse, you know, that Christ talks about. St. Jerome, for example, commentates that by stating that um, part of the fruits is not just the ethical, ethical actions, but it's also the true doctrine. So if someone has good ethical actions, but false doctrine, then they bear bad fruit. So you need to have good ethical doctrines, but also the good, you know, true doctrines that was passed down, for example, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, um, as well. So there's also that point of continuity established uh, and, and maintained in, uh, in Christ himself, in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, one more minor point that I, I'll mention in passing, because they didn't really go into it, was that they got into the topic of postmodernism and whether postmodernists were Marxist. And there is some overlap, but postmodernism, strictly speaking, is not very amenable to Marxism. It's kind of like there were people who were uh, hardcore Marxists who believed in a lot of liberal ideas, and they might have gone over into something more postmodern. We can see that maybe in people like 
Horkheimer and Adorno, people coming out of the Frankfurt School. But uh, strictly speaking, Marxism does not like liberalism and it would not be for postmodernism. And this is something where they had a bit of contention and discussion over this topic. And you can go into the scholarly academic literature. There's a whole book by uh, Francis, Dr. Francis Stoner Saunders, uh, which covers the fact that in the Cold War era, it was actually the deconstructionists and postmodernists that were working together with the CIA in Cold War propaganda. So clearly, if the CIA wanted to combat Marxism, uh, they wouldn't have hired Marxists. They hired postmodernists and, and fostered postmodern art, abstract art. This is well documented in numerous mo mainstream publications, including The Telegraph, The London Independent, etc. They all have the history of uh, Western intelligence agencies fostering and funding abstract and degenerate art through postmodernists, through working even explicitly with deconstructionists in, Fr in France, Derrida and others. And so uh, that's actually what's going on here. There is some overlap, but all that occurs in the movement from, uh, th from um, Marxism or liberalism in that sense to postmodernism is that postmodernists adopted a, a, a more of the uh, oppressor narrative, right? So they did talk about oppressor oppressed narrative because everything is power relations. But that's not Marxism proper, right? Saying everything is oppressor or oppressed narratives, there's overlap, but that's not really the Marxist narrative. That's something that evolves. And so maybe Jordan Peterson just kind of uses uh, Marxism as a kind of a, a general catch-all for all liberalism and all leftism, which uh, I think we need to be a little more uh, nuanced than that. That would be one area of critique I would have. Yeah, I also want to add that this this clip is shared a lot and people are using this against uh, Peterson where when he's asked, do you believe in God? He starts to like deconstruct the statement. OK, there's a couple of things going on in that statement. What does it mean? Do what does it mean? You what does it mean? Believe in God. And um, he kind of and I actually think maybe we might disagree, but I actually think that's a that's a decent question to ask. The problem is, you know, the intention behind the question asked, but where he gets this to is that he makes the point. I think Peugeot is in agreement with he'd rather see what you do than you making a verbal proposition. And uh, that's that kind of gets into the clash in the approaches between Peterson and um hijab where hijab is kind of basically asking him if you will accept his propositions and peterson is basically saying no i want to see what you do and what i would like to introduce for people who might not know orthodoxy in this level is that we have an answer to this kind of question and this the answer to that question is the lives of the saints and we see the lives of the saints as the continuation of the book of acts and so the lives of the saints is really you know you can read the various different lives of saints that in which they do, you know, they, they, they do the act of believing in God in their lives. Many of these people are martyrs. Many of these people are confessors. Many of these people are passion bearers. And so they're great examples on how to live your faith uh, in the Christian manner. And they're great examples of the principle that St. Paul lies down, which is that imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so as we imitate the saints in, the, in what they do as they imitate Christ, we become imitators of Christ, which is how one achieves the path to holiness. So I will say in that regard, Christianity has that idea, which um, is not really, even if it exists in some minor capacity, is, is an idea that is really not present much in Islam. Really, the ultimate saint in Islam is just mainly Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and then secondary saints will be kind of like the prophets. And, but after that, there aren't really many, the, the concept of, as, as I've seen it, in the Christian sense, where you can visibly see the doers of the faith, it's more so preserved in kind of like more Sufi um, understandings of Islam, so to speak, which does, which to my knowledge is not the school of thought that hijab will be in agreement with in some capacity. Yeah, great points. And I did want to uh, cite my sources because I'm sure everybody will lose their lid and flip out because I made statements that aren't even uh, doubted in the academic literature. You'll notice that multiple mainstream publications uh, support the philosophical and Cold War point that I made. So I just, I'm always very uh, precise about citing all of the sources. And you'll notice that they're not 
praise conspiracy theories. They're literally it's literally in the academic literature. Go read the Cultural Cold War by Dr. Francis Stoner Saunders. It's it's an entire book on this topic. Now, um, in my notes, I think the last thing I had was uh, on the the hijab uh, topic. We covered the quadra. We, we covered all that. Um, the myths element. We got to that. Let's see. Yeah, I think you're right, David, to point out the... I, on the one hand, I understand where Jordan Peterson is going with Pins on What You Mean, uh, which he's known for, right? Where he's saying, um, we need to understand what your assumptions are for the various terms that you're using when you say, do you believe in God, right? That's a fair question to ask, particularly if we were right having a discussion with um, another so-called monotheist or a Unitarian or a, a cult member, Right. Well, if we all say, oh, yeah, we all believe in God, that doesn't mean that the reference G.O.D. is pointing to the same thing, because I might be talking to a theistic Satanist who believes that God is the devil. I might be talking to a Mormon who believes that God is uh, three separate persons or beings, uh, which they have a, a, a tritheistic type of theology. I might be talking to Jehovah's Witness who thinks that God is not the son. God is only a Unitarian father deity. So the word God is is ambiguous. However, I think Jordan went a little too far in sort of getting into linguistic ambiguities and linguistic philosophy by saying, depends on what you mean by do, depends on what you mean by, I mean, every, the question wasn't about, you know, the presuppositions of linguistic philosophy, which is true. You can do that. You can critique and get into what is involved in, uh, you know, a sentence. What are the metaphysics of a sentence? That's all part of philosophy, but that's not what was being asked. And so it would have been, I think, a much, uh, better approach to just be a little more forthright in answering you know um well if you believe in god it's pretty easy to say well yeah or no yeah or no right yes or no right yeah i think that was the main complaint that i had as well and some people had that complaint mainly people kind of didn't understand that because it, it was actually a relevant question for him to ask because uh, previously in the stream why would hijab kind of get made a natural theology-ish statement about how everyone can reason that there is a creator. But again, you know, that begs the question, what, what's the characteristic of that creator? I mean, is it an eternal creator in which, in which creation is eternal, right? So this is one of yeah, the questions that you can Yeah, and they just at that point, ask. right, they just rely on actually a bunch of Aristotle. Yeah, and, you know, is, is he created in the sense that he's creating out of nothing in the first place? I mean, even that can be asked. Right? Maybe he, the creator is merely the architect in the sense that the architect is the creator of buildings, for example. So um, he's, I think there, there's two extremes at hand. And the truth is, in this case, um, somewhere in the middle, where we basically have to understand that these terms have presuppositions. But at the same time, um, we can't go to the two extreme where we can selectively start, you know, being Petersonian when we were being asked a simple question. I think that's the kind of the main yeah, issue exactly. that I had with it. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, now, Lewis and Kai, I wanted to ask you guys a question about this next uh, argument that Muhammad Hijab moves to, which is one that I see pop up every now and then. I think Muslims try to, they like to throw this one out to kind of like new audiences and people that are tuning in who not, don't really know anything about Islam. Um, there's a falsification test within uh, the Quran and the the test is that come and test the Quran and you'll see that it has all these miraculous elements to it, miraculous future predictions, and therefore we know then that Muhammad was a true prophet because of all these quote uh, Quranic miracles. What what would you guys like to say to to that uh, often used argument? Here you go ahead, Kai. Yeah. Well, okay. There. Are there are a couple things here, at least. Um, one of them is the ineptability of the Quran, like in terms of its linguistics. And so it, they're basically saying that you cannot produce some kind of linguistic uh, structure like the Quran has. in because you can't do that, then it means that the Quran must be some kind of divine revelation. Um, I mean, people have addressed this. Um, Louis Dizon, actually, he act made um, a recent video uh, talking about this. And he's like, well, can we actually take a look at different, 
different scriptures. And one that he uses for as an example is uh, the Mormon scripture. And he says, well, can we see some kind of intricate structure within the Mormon scripture that could possibly suggest some kind of planning was involved, right. <laughs> whether or not it really exists or not. But he demonstrates there is there is some kind of structured complexity. Not that I'm now preaching in favor of Mormonism, so don't get me wrong there. But he's just saying is that there, there, there's nothing special here. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing, there is another argument whereby, well, I mean, if you're going to kind of beg the question and assume that the Quran is correct to begin with, then by that very definition or that very notion, you're saying that whatever it contains is correct. So then what exactly is the standard? I mean, you have, if you're saying it's correct, and then you're saying that's the standard by which you have to judge it, well, it's like really any kind of text of the Quran is going to set the standard. And so you have to imitate something that um, is begging the question here. The other thing is with regards to um, you look at all the foreign vocabulary in the Quran and so many commentaries, commentaries upon commentaries that literally the Muslim scholars, they say, well, we don't know what that word means. We don't know what that word means. We don't know what that word means. So it's like, well, you want, you're putting forth a challenge to produce something where you guys yourselves don't even know what the text is actually saying and you're just guessing. So it's like, what kind of challenge is that? Um, so there, there's that challenge. Then there's another one with regards to some kind of wars that will happen. Um, and there'll be one side will be victorious. The other one will be defeated. But then when you actually look at the text, it's completely ambiguous. It doesn't tell you which side is going to be the victor, which side is going to be defeated. It doesn't tell you when it's going to occur. And if you um, look at the commentaries, you can actually come up with different different scenarios. So that's not specific in any sense whatsoever. So um, the, like, so you're basically you're saying it's like no Nostradamus style, right? Where it's like a great leader shall fall <laughs> and, exactly. and one side shall win. <laughs> Whoa! Exactly. Well, that's, right. that's exactly that Nostradonk kind of stuff you get. Yeah. Um, then they'll say, well, you have all these like scientific miracles that you can find. I mean, th those have been debunked. Um, I'm not really going to go into it. It's just basically um, manipulating words, manip manipulating meanings, um, reading into it. Uh, there's lots of material out there that yeah, just Sam, of, Sam Shamoon has a good they... Sam Shamoon has a good stream. I'll let you go uh, after this, Lewis, where he goes into depth with a lot of these uh, claims of the miraculous codes within the Quran and this kind of stuff. Um, he did a stream a while back, so if you Google that, you could find uh, Sam Shamoon debunking that as well. Well, yeah, I mean my. My approach to this is just very simple. Um, you know, that may all be the case. But the thing is, is that demons are, you know, highly intellectual, like beings of pure intellect. They have uh, knowledge of lots of things that we don't know about. In fact, they probably know, like, most facts about the physical world more immediately, like, than we do. And so it's not exactly surprising that, you know, a demon or an angel, like a fallen angel, could produce you know, you know yeah and this is precisely the reasoning of galatians 1 right that's what paul says right even if a if a beautiful radiant angel came and told you to follow some other theology uh you know which is kind of a miraculous event right you don't follow it i'll bite i will say that um one argument that is potentially very convincing for the miraculousness of the quran is that the word middle appears in the middle of the second surah so i mean how are you going to explain that especially when the quran was revealed over several years in different parts and then you kind of put it together i mean that's so miraculous i mean in case you didn't pick on i'm basically mocking a certain apologist out there who <laughs> was convinced by that argument <laughs> yeah um so anything else before we move to the tate talk uh, the only thing I will add is that uh, for us, prophecy is more kind of theological. And uh, when we look at the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and the characteristics of the Messiah and what he is going to do in history, uh, not only in scripture can we see this, but we can also even see some of these prophecies being fulfilled in Christ, even by uh, hostile sources like Josephus. And uh, I think the Christian understanding of prophecy in that sense is stronger but and also there's a key detail and one of the reasons why we don't really believe that there can be more prophets is because christ being the fulfillment of that office where prophecy prophethoods 
you know, profits were produced from to say that there are going to be more profits. Now, prophecy and profits are a distinct thing. And, um, you know, there's still prophecy, but the office of the prophethood, that is not some that is fulfilled in Christ. To say that that's, that's going to continue in the, for example, in the seventh century is to basically deny that Christ fulfills the old law and, and completes sure. it in his right. person. Um, and so for us, prophecy isn't as, as if like we're going to, uh, oh, 2000 years later, something like purely political is going to occur and the world will end, right? Like, you know, people treat prophecy like that. For us, prophecy is more so um, really uh, God's promise. And, and prophecy is also done by stories and, and the types of these stories, right? Like think of the uh, binding of Isaac. How to worship. Um, the father sacrifices the only begotten son on something wooden. I mean, that's pretty much pointing to something in the future that's going to happen, which is a crucifixion. The father is going to sacrifice his only begotten son on something wooden. And, um, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, the, uh, the, the substitution of in the story of, I, you know, the, the binding of Isaac was caught by his horns, signifying the uh, crown of thorns that Christ will bear. So there's very different there's many different stories just like this one when i say story i mean you know literal story in that sense there's many different events in the bible like this that in their events prophesize what's going to happen in the future so for us you know there's also there's direct prophecy that a lot of people are associated with but there's also typology that can also be considered some kind of prophecy and that's how we right. understand these things and so these events kind of point out to something miraculous that's going to happen in the future. The burning bush is another one pointing out to the incarnation, how the unconsuming presence of God was in something created, just like how God incarnate through the Virgin Mary, right? The, you know, the Virgin Mary preserving um, God in his human body, uh, just like the burning bush was in some capacity. So there's very, very, so our understanding of prophecy is very different in that sense is of what I will a lot, a lot of people yeah and well, i'd you... also like to say just one last thing about the prophecy thing is that and this might you may just i may get some disagreement on this but christian um <clears throat> his christian like i said historically hasn't like christian tradition hasn't been entirely opposed to the notion of like even uh pagan or uh, authors historically having right predictions i think even some christian authors have said that you know plato predicted the the you know the christ and his suffering and redemption of man and also if you read like even say really famous uh, uh, uh song the ds ira um it mentions that the the apocalypse is testified to by both david king david and the the sibylite oracles of the pagans so it's you know it's not exactly something that's unusual the question is like are you a prophet that is from god or or not yeah, and if people want a, a fuller treatment of the specific uh, theological objections to um, Islam in regard to continuity with the Old Testament, who really has continuity with the Bible proper, who, who's the real person who has the rights to the book, uh, there's my stream covering this in depth. I'll put the link right there in the chat on that topic, and you can go see uh, the biblical arguments that I make, as well as you can watch the argument that we did with Azra Rashid on Tawheed versus Trinity. I'll put that right there. That's a whole debate. And then a separate debate with uh, Dr. Shabir Ali uh, on the Trinity and the person of Christ as well. So those <clears throat> those are uh, fuller treatments and discussions of this topic. Now, I, I think, also, Kai, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I would also add to that list Lewis's video on the uh, continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament and how he shows... Uh, yes. that basically we have all those elements that we would expect when you study the Old Testament, which are completely lacking within Islam. Well, that add, point is great to make. Um, if you, I don't know if you can do this, Jay, uh, but I sent two pictures into the Discord chat that I, as we transition into talking about the comparison between sort of Jordan Peterson's uh, careful, uh, thoughtful, uh, kind of deep grappling perhaps with uh... God and with Christianity, um, I mean, he. I really think he's grappling. I think Jonathan would agree. Um, and there's plenty of videos of him struggling with it. He says he struggles with it. But he is thoughtfully and emotionally, uh, you know, struggling with his idea. But we'll compare this to, um, you know, um, Andrew Tate. So I think uh, I just wanted to have those two pictures up side by side, if you can. 
Yeah, let uh, me try to. I'll, I'll try to pull those up. Uh, maybe as Kai, I think you wanted to kind of introduce the second part where we get into the Tate talk. Yes, uh, if you don't mind, I guess we can switch gears and we can start going into the Tate issue. And I'm just going to monologue here for a few minutes. It's not going to be one of my epic ones where I kind of just go on and on. Um, so my interest um, is not so much with regards to Tate himself. And although I do have my opinions on some of the stuff he says, and I'm not minimizing or diminishing others who want to speak to those issues more directly, I'm more interested in observing the general Muslim reaction to Tate as this gives us insight into Muslim society and culture. And one of the things that is very apparent when you listen to Tate talk about his acceptance of Islam and something you will pick up on immediately is that for him, Islam is appealing because he finds that it aligns with his own personal views. Now that he finds a religion out there that aligns with his personal views is not something that I necessarily take issue with, but the fact that so many Muslims prop him up knowing that he says the things that he says and does the things that he does, it is an implicit admission that Tate's assessment of Islam in a broad sense is indeed correct. So Muslims want to portray that the things that Tate needs to focus on now that he's Muslim are to fill in the ritualistic aspects of Islam, like how to do the daily prayers, more so than it is about adopting a new worldview. And this is an important point because when non-Muslims criticize Tate or the Muslim reaction to Tate's acceptance of Islam, we don't care whether or not Tate knows how to pray. Those are non-issues for us. We don't care if he places his hands across his chest or dangles them at his sides. These kinds of ritualistic aspects of Islam are irrelevant. The concern is about legitimizing and normalizing the degenerate practices of Islam that are detrimental to society and fundamentally satanic. And what happens is Islam as a whole is looked upon and treated as an altogether replacement of everything Western. Now, for me as an Orthodox Christian, my concern is more about living in an Orthodox Christian society, a truly Orthodox Christian society, not just a secular, quote-unquote, Western society whose cultural heritage is nominally Orthodox. And so Tate accepting Islam is to altogether supplant other worldviews, not just the Western worldview but also the Orthodox Christian worldview. And he doesn't get to pick and choose what aspects of Islam he gets to import. He doesn't get to say only those parts of Islam that align with his own personal views are to be foundational to the society he wants to live in. He has to accept all of Islam, and that means accepting things like grown men having sexual intercourse with prepubescent children, the mandatory killing of apostates, the thimitude of Christians, and so on. And this is the point that I think a lot of people fail to grasp in the criticism of Tate accepting Islam. Tate as a person, as an individual becoming Muslim, is actually a subsidiary point. The overarching issue at play is the legitimization of the underlying barbarism and degeneracy of Islam. And this is really what Muslims are championing. Muslims are championing Islam, supplanting the West, replacing one form of degeneracy with their own form of degeneracy. So the issue really is a referendum whether or not we as non-Muslims want an Islamic society. It's not just about rejecting the West or rejecting Christianity to conflate the two as Muslims like to do. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is whether or not rejection of the West equates with acceptance of Islam. So we as Orthodox Christians reject both degeneracies. And so we don't fall into this trap to think that rejection of the West means rejection of Christianity means acceptance of Islam. Orthodoxy or true orthodoxy practiced as a living faith and not just as a cultural heritage is the solution to the degeneracy of the West and the degeneracy of Islam. We as 
Orthodox Christians push back on a lot of things that we see as problematic in the West. And in many cases, we are in agreement with Muslims, but we also push back on those elements of Islam that we find problematic, like sexual intercourse with prepubescent children that we don't want in our society. So we have to be vigilant to guard against Muslims presenting people with a false dichotomy that Islam is not the solution to Western degeneracy. Rather, people should start looking into orthodoxy. And once they do, they will see that it staves off the degeneracies of both the West and Islam. Yeah, I don't know if you can still have those those pictures up by any chance, but um, just in terms of the continuity, it's like, like for someone like Peterson, I just wanted to say this last thing is just like, look, that's the, the, the one on the one on the left is 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 a bare kind of commute almost like a community hall uh, but that's what it looks like inside um you know a, a, an average mosque but the right is like a, an average orthodox church and it's like you look at the left and, and when you're thinking about old testament you know because you know the, the point hijab makes in the interview is like look to be muslim is just to follow the you know the prophets abraham moses etc etc it's like okay well let's look at let's look at the the temple worship right let's look at the temple worship on, on yeah, this, exactly in this instance on the left where's where's the where's the um the golden angels where's the images of the sons of god where's the where's the altar where's the where's the priest where's right. any of the stuff that moses would have believed yeah and they, they the... seem to be either completely ignorant or uh, don't even have any place or concern for explaining why you know gigantic portions of the old testament which they claim to be some inheritor of uh, deals with the law the tabernacle the sacrifice the altar the incense the priesthood you know all these elements which are uh, said to never they don't go away in the old testament right christ in the psalms is a priest uh, forever according to the order of of melchizedek and so that's precisely why um, Lewis made his great video uh, covering the continuity of worship, which really illustrates and proves this point that Lewis is making. And I also did uh, my own live stream covering the exact same topic theologically. Again, I'll put this into the chat. That the, the crucial, is- crucial issue between the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jew is who's really in continuity? Uh, do you think that the Old Testament worship looked like a barren lecture hall or do you think that it looked like what you see above yeah just google the uh you know a um the temple of solomon right like just google a historical kind of reconstruction uh, artistic reconstruction of what the temple of solomon would have looked like and then just compare that to these two and then you know and this is like this is the point about transcendent beauty i i i mentioned earlier it's like i i don't think i don't think peterson's going to go for 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 the the visual uh the visuals on the left if you know what i mean obviously i'm not making an, an aesthetics argument but i'm just pointing this out because yeah, i think it's important point. um in terms of history in terms of continuity with the prophetic tradition absolutely yeah and i have a whole video on uh covering the temple uh the symbolism of the temple and the continuity with that if you want to look into solomon's temple and the way that the liturgical worship was practiced by all of the people that they're supposed to be in continuity with, which obviously they're not in co- continuity with. <laughs> I mean, anybody who's, yeah. read, anybody who's read any of the Torah would know that uh, you have gigantic portions, Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, which are dealing with liturgical worship, which they don't have. Yeah, and it also kind of raises the question, I mean, there is, for, you know, part of, the presupposition of religions like Islam, Christianity, and Judaism is that there is, you know, from the start of the creation of the world to the finish, there is this kind of visible community that, you know, again, from the, from start to finish, there is no part of history where, like, for example, in the fourth century, there were no true believers, kind of like a thinking. I mean, this will contradict the very idea of God uh, being present in creation, revealing himself to us. So, uh, a, a basic question to also ask is where are the true Islamic believers between the first and the seventh yeah. centuries? Right. Where is the community? Where is the visible community? And there, you're gonna you're gonna find out that there is zero. There is none. There's no yeah. evidence. The yeah. best evidence I- is like some some Gnostic heretics. But you look deeper into what they believe, and it's that completely contradicts Islam. So there's no no heretics that believe in anything close to Islam either.
Let's look at the... Says, right, bring your evidence, right? Where's the evidence? Yeah, he says, bring the evidence. Uh, we can also think about, well, how did, uh, and in what way did all the prophets in the Old Testament and Jesus, how did they worship God? Oh, well, we have a way to know that. And you can see above these uh, configurations as to what the Old Testament describes the worship of Israel as. And you'll notice the interior, there are images, there is uh, iconographic representations, there's angels, there's gold. Uh, it's iconographic. It is not iconoclastic. And so guess what? That's how Jesus worshiped God when he went to the temple, when there was the day of atonement, right? This is, this is how Jesus worshiped God. Now, if this is all idolatrous, then one of their key prophets, Jesus, right, was, was worshiping in this idolatrous way. Likewise, Isaiah, Ezekiel, any of the prophets who attended the worship of the temple, would have been worshiping in this uh, this very way and remember um the images are of cherubim and uh seraphim these are the highest spiritual beings excluding god himself so the highest supernatural beings in the spiritual order could you know we could make images off of them in the period of the exodus right starting from the period of exodus as god he talks about the temple worship and so um, that points out that, you know, this, the second commandment, which is cites as, cited as an argument against iconography, is just referring to the only thing that cannot be, you know, made an image of, and that is the nature of God in his invisibility. But that's why we could depict God who became incarnate, which is Christ himself, right? As St. Paul says, he kind of ties into this principle by saying that Christ became a little lower than the angels. And people kind of ask themselves, well, what does that even mean? I mean, he's basically saying he became man. But another point, I believe, the way I understand it, is that it also points out that uh, being a little lower than the angels in the, in the sense that he becoming man also signifies that we can make images of Christ himself and images of those who were deified by the divine power, the divine energies of God as well. That's why we have images of the saints as well um, so i think that's kind of like a minor niche thing that actually is important to consider that the cherubim and the seraphim are the highest spiritual beings again excluding god who is the highest spiritual being obviously in terms of the ordering so i think there's kind of like a massive point in regards to that as well in in terms of like the iconography and the right. principles of iconography for that reason Guys, I want to remind you really quick, interlude before we go back to Kai on some of his points. Uh, if you want to support my channel, we have a channel sponsor, which is, of course, uh, Chalk.com. This is the elite brand of supplements. Chalk has been my sponsor for over a year. They offer the best when it comes to uh, supplementation for nutrient-deficient diets. Of course, all of us in the West, especially, we have nutrient-deficient diets. And so we need supplementation. And the way to do that is to go to Chalk.com at C-H-O-Q.com and utilize uh, the pr promo code, which will give you 50% off things like Action 2.0 to promote your uh, lack of energy. You want to up that testosterone. You want to up that tiny ball syndrome that some dudes have. Well, go to Chalk.com and get your, act, get your hands on some of that daily right there. You can get uh, some of the, my favorite, peer-reviewed, shown to boost testosterone, Tonkat Ali. And use the promo code J50 to get 50% off. You can also use the promo code J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, to put in a recurring subscription and get access to the best that Chalk.com answers. Again, Chalk.com, awesome, based red pill company. Go check them out. Uh, Kai, did you want to say anything else about um, kind of your interlude as we move to the Tate thing? No, I pretty much summed it up. It just basically, it's... Um... I just want people to realize that we're not fixated necessarily on Tate, the person. This is just right. kind of an exhibition of um, the overall sentiments from Muslims, the attitude, this kind of cheerleading, this championing whenever they see somebody adopting the religion without basically knowing anything whatsoever. Yeah, it's optics that, and propaganda, right? Yeah, it's just propaganda because the thing is, like, Muslims don't want to talk about the overwhelming number of people who actually end up leaving Islam. Or if they hear about or get wind that, that somebody left, they're like, oh, well, they never really were Muslim to begin with kind of thing. Just this minimization. It's really more speaking to the issue of them needing this kind of validation, this affirmation, this, like, need to be told, oh, that, they, that they're that they right or something like that. It's like this 
um, like we had in a community post recently, this kind of inferiority complex, like that's really kind of what's getting, getting added. I mean, nobody really kind of looks at Tate and sees, uh, thinks or is convinced that he converted because of some kind of intellectual persuasion. Well, people in the chat are even saying that, oh, he didn't really believe it. He just thinks that it's useful. And I mean, people defending the position. Well, but it, that's not a real conversion, right? So, I mean, I don't know what his position is. I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not judging his motives. Maybe he really does believe it. But um, if he doesn't believe it, then that's not a real conversion, right? That would be for other reasons. I mean, a real conversion means that you really believe the religion and you want to live according to its standards, even if we all mess up, sure. But I mean, if we want to talk about what a real conversion is, I mean, it means believing the religion. And, and so there's, a, there's an interesting parallel here between the person of Peterson and his attitude toward orthodoxy that Lewis brought up and then Tate's attitude towards Islam. And it seems like, according to the arguments that he makes, right, he says Christ, Christianity is just weak. Well, that would apply to most forms of Christianity, yeah, or so-called Christianity. Um, but it doesn't apply to, you know, actual uh, historic, um, masculine Orthodox Christianity. I don't think it applies to that at all. As, at all, um, and I don't get the impression from Tate's uh, upbringing in in uh, Romania or whatever kind of Romanian Orthodox he was brought up in or whatever that he got a big uh, got a, a lot of catechesis. I did have a, a, a conversation with his brother um, a couple of years ago, and he seemed to be a little more cognizant of the of the theology and the issues. So. Uh, you know, maybe his brother is a little more grounded in, in what Orthodox Christianity says, but I don't get the impression that Tate made his decision on the basis, as you said, of the theology. Well, I, um, I would say one thing, uh, well, a couple of things is like, I, I don't know what he's done since uh, becoming a Muslim, right? But they both made a lot of money off of um, essentially, essentially being uh, pornographers. I mean, they they run a um, cam girling site or i don't know if they still do uh, as far as i know it's not down yet but someone like say roosh uh, you know roosh when roosh left that kind of lifestyle and uh Mine. became uh, orthodox he unpublished all of his uh, as far uh, as i'm aware all of his, like all of his books um so um he says so on his blog anyway um because they were leading um men into sin um so you really have to kind of you know ask yourself like what's the what's the fruits of the conversion um here um i'd like to know i mean this the patristics clearly teach that you have to uh, actually repent and undergo a, a process as i mentioned earlier of purification before you're even baptized so you can't just you can't just come to god in all your kind of like uh you know dirty rags you know cold turkey like you have to undergo a certain degree a certain amount of purification before going through baptism you have to you know a lot of traditions do a life confession before you before you go to baptism i mean it's not just it's not just uh you know it's not it's not that e it's not that easy right That's well let's uh, kai and lewis what would you say to this kind of argument that well maybe i don't know all the theology uh because i'm hearing this a lot but Islam is based in trad, and so since since a lot of Western Christianity is you know skittles and degenerate, uh, isn't this what's uh, masculine based in trad? Isn't that good enough to make a decision about where I want to you know go religiously? That's what a lot of people are pulling from the Tate you know clips and stuff. Um, I'll say one thing before Kai then um, is that. One of the thing that Tate has a big issue with with uh, Western uh, secular liberalism is that it's, uh, in a sense, he makes this argument like, well, the slave the slave mindset basically comes from um, not being able to challenge the mainstream narrative about you know X Y Z, and because that's because they just censor and silence anyone who tries to have a different view and say no, I'm not going to believe that. Well, it, this is kind of funny because, I mean, that's exactly what would happen. Like if you left, if you openly left Islam or, um, you know, uh, disagreed with it, criticized it in uh, any of the majority Muslim nations as uh, you would get imprisoned or executed. And it's like, look, you can't, you can't, you can't hold both. You can't believe both those things, right? Where, he, you know, he says in his interview with Hijab, he says like the guys who, 
the guys who censor are always the bad guys. Like, they're never the good guys. And it's like, well, Hijab has engaged in censorship. In fact, when David Wood um, was, That's you know, doing some things, I would, I would, you know, I would criticize him. I don't think he should be, like, eating the Quran and stuff like that, personally. Um, I think that's wrong. Uh, as in, like, it's, I, I just think it's it's not helpful. But uh, Hijab, like, made a video doing this whole thing where it's like, hey, make an, all, all, all my viewers make an account on Patreon. Go and uh, report his content, like, mass report his content so that it gets taken down. I mean, he's using the tools of liberal censorship, which just happens to, um, you know, side with Islam nowadays um, against Christianity. You know, it's kind of like that tug of war meme where you have the, the guy with the rainbow flag and then he's like wait and he looks to his left and there's like a guy with a like a jihadi flag on him yeah, yeah. um pushing pulling against the the christians but uh, the christian side but you know it's like you can't hold both those views you can't be like well this is based because it's intolerant but also censorship is the you know censorship is the, the, the slave the slave right. makers right <laughs> yeah okay so i guess i'll just chime in here so for me there's uh there's a few things going on um there's obviously an element of counterculture here, and perhaps the most accessible to the majority of people that represents counterculture is probably Islam. Um, they just, you walk around, you see mosques, you see, um, you just see it everywhere. And so it's kind of like the first avenue that is most easily accessible to a person. That said, um, Islam kind of fosters this ability to um, be a channel to kind of unleash all of this kind of pent up feelings inside. It lets you release, if you will. And so what ends up happening is, is people are drawn to it because they have this sense of release. They have the sense of validation that yes, their beliefs are um, true. There are other people that share them and they'll help you kind of um, cultivate that um, that notion of counterculture. The other thing also is that um, Islam is by design meant to be as easy as possible or not as imposing as possible. Um, give me one second here for a second, please. Yeah, great points. I mean, uh, and I'm not sure where Kai's going to go, but I mean, what I would add to that is, well, just because something is simplistic and boiled down and very... Uh, sort of easy to adopt that doesn't really have anything to do with whether it's true or not <laughs> i mean there's all kinds of things that can be very complex um and right might be true or might be false right so simplicity itself is not necessarily a mark of you know objective truth yeah uh, okay, i would sorry, say uh well yeah go ahead kai sorry i thought you were gonna be long uh, gone yeah long yeah, yeah no no there's just some just minor disruption there so no so just to get on to that point here yeah th there's this aspect of it just being very easy and not to discount what you had just said jay but this idea of um basically allowing you to kind of feel part of a community that shares the same values as you, but with minimal imposition or obstacles for you to feel part of the community. Because if, for example, if you have this very strong sense of counterculture and you come to, let's say, the Orthodox Church and they say, well, you're going to have to um, undergo a catechumenate that could last six months, that could last a year, that could last maybe longer than that, you kind of feel as if you may be inhibited you go to Islam, you just say a couple of phrases, and all of a sudden you're part of this community. You're a full member. There's nothing else that you really have to do. And so it kind of, it's taking a shortcut, if you will, to help you identify with that group that you want to channel your emotions through. And I think that's that's something that is very appealing to a lot of people. They just basically can turn off their brains and engage fully with their emotions um so that's that no great then point. there's a great point yeah and there's also a third thing that i want to bring up and that is is there's a there's like a novelty to it so it's like this new thing so people are enamored by it they're not they haven't been um well accustomed to it or acquainted with it and so it's something new it's something exotic let me go and check it out because you may be familiar with Christianity growing up. You may have gone to church and it's just kind of the same old thing, but you're just not really getting anything from it. It's like opening up a new present uh, Christmas, if you will, when you go to the mosque, it's something new. It's something to kind of 
that new um, fresh smell when you like open up something for the first time. And then sadly for a lot of people, they find out that, well, once they go more and more deep, they actually unravel what's all entailed with um, this new belief system that they've now just adopted. And a lot of them just kind of get hit really hard and will end up leaving. Yeah, great points. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to make a point. Actually, Luis, go ahead. Go ahead. You're you're in line. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I think maybe Western Europe has um, probably a bigger issue with uh, limp-wristed Christianity, especially England. I mean, I know that's where Tate was, uh, as I understand, where Tate was brought up. England's got it real bad, um, and then like other Western uh, European nations have it pretty bad too. France and um, Scandinavian countries, etc. But I think that even if you look, and I'll talk about the Eastern Europe in a second, but I think if you look at like um, America, I mean, if you look at the main kind of big public figures that are opposing Skittles, uh, it's someone like Matt Walsh, right, who's a Christian and his entire following is Christian. Um, and he's having a pretty big, you know, social so, social impact and pushback against the that that stuff specifically stuff he's talking about um so i don't think it's entirely true that uh, christianity everywhere is limpristed i mean a america in, in in west in the west i think america has it pretty i mean there's, there's there seems to be a pretty strong conservative um evangelical kind of um group and you know the baptists and all that kind of stuff so i, I, don't, I don't think it's entirely a, an accurate characterization and then when you look at the eastern europe as well um i mean it, just look at you know hung, somewhere he's been right Romania, but then look at Hungary. I mean Hungary is getting attacked right now by the EU Commission for banning uh, Skittles propaganda uh, against children, um, which was majority voted by um, the the Hungarian peoples, as I understand. Uh, so like you've got that, and then you've got well you know other Eastern European countries, Ukraine, um, and. Uh, uh, Serbia, Bulgaria, all of these countries that are um, um, either majority Christian or Orthodox have opposed these things very openly, very vociferously within their own countries. So I, I don't think it's accurate to just say that Christianity, you know, Christianity isn't just the right. Anglo, the Anglo world, right? Like that's right. not, you know, and 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 you know what's left of what's going on in Western Europe. But I think another thing to understand is that the that Christianity in these regions has been under. Um, as you as you've noted many times, Jay, uh, powerful monetary elite um, subversion, absolutely, uh, an ideological subversion for um, I don't even know, Jay. You tell me a century, century, two centuries. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> so I mean, like we haven't even seen that kind of activity being born onto um, kind of like majority Islamic countries yet, um, because I think Western uh, liberalism kind of sees. Um, Islam as useful for the time being, right? I, I, at least I think. Uh, I might yeah, be like, totally mm -hmm. wrong. I mean, but... the the smallest, like in Turkey here, like it had like a only like a small like influence of Western secularism and part of its foundation. And you know, it's according to various statistics and polls, only twenty percent of the Muslims in Turkey um, actually are pro Sharia, which goes to show that you know. It, so that that is a very irregular for example understanding because in most muslim countries sharia is heavily supported in various different muslim countries but in turkey it's not in turkey it's actually very much opposed even um uh, if the leader of that country is someone who's very pro islam great points i yeah, would add and to I, I had some other stuff to say but yeah, yeah go ahead sorry i want uh, i yeah uh, jay before you move on yeah. i wanted to say this and i wanted to make this point because it does connect with hijab and it connects with tate as well um one of the biggest complaints andrew tate had about london being a, a you know failed society particularly in 2020 is the um the violence in london he will constantly talk about that all the time like the, you know the knife attacks and things like that well What's really interesting is that the, the, I suppose, what has encouraged that kind of behavior to be normal in London has recently been inflamed. And what I'm talking about is kind of this, you know, um, multiculturalism and things like that. In Leicester, for example, there was recently a clash 
um, between Hindus and Muslims. And guess who was part of that, you know, battle? Muhammad Dija was part of that. And he posted it on Instagram being proud about it. Now, obviously, the rhetoric was that we're just defending our community, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing I find very interesting that connects to the fact that of, you know, how the elites think Islam is useful is that if you look at the joint statement for peace <clears throat> by Muslim and Hindu communities, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the first thing they say is pointing out that, you know, we came here and we fought against uh, you know, haters, people who, you know, were, were hating us. And he's pretty much referring to, you know, British people who were not pro-multiculturalism. And so, you know, these people, you know, if you listen to Tate, you kind of think that, oh, you know, London is a failed society, but then he is supporting the very thing that is being used as, you know, as a weapon against Western society. Now, I also believe that um, I agree with uh, Lewis's point wholeheartedly about the whole, um, you know, corruption thing, right? Like for one and two centuries, Christianity has been the target for uh, elites for a very long time. And we're kind of at the stage where, you know, they're, they're trying to move their sites. Okay, we completed most of the Western forms of Christianity. We've infiltrated Roman Catholicism, etc. Now it's time to look to Orthodox Christianity. Um, Islam has only very recently been in the sight of the kind of um, liberal machine to kind of destroy. And, and a lot of people... In 2015, especially, uh, initially, well, not in 2015, but 2014, initially thought, well, there's going to be demographic shifts and there's going to be kind of like a new religion coming into various different European countries. But now a lot of people are starting to realize, wait a second, I mean, these people who come in here, you know, not even a one generation passed before these people suddenly starts to, you know, even though they're Muslim, they suddenly start to, you know, promote skills propaganda. They suddenly start to have female imams in different European countries. I mean, just not even a generation has passed and these things are starting to occur and happen. Imagine what will happen if these people are here for two, three, four, five, you know, six generations, right? If a century passed, yeah. what will be the shape of this religion? So um, I think the problem with Andrew Tate's decision here is kind of just, he doesn't really realize that that process hasn't even begun. It only has very recently begun. And I'm already starting to see the effects of it in academia, where various different ac academics, both in Turkey and in places in Europe, when you talk, when your Islamic academics are starting to promote certain ideas that I'm willing to agree that these are probably false, you know, they, they don't reflect Islam truthfully. But the point that I'm trying to make is that these academic points that was used against Christianity by various different pseudo scholars are now, you know, these scholars are now being trained, so to speak, by these universities and by these institutions. So you shouldn't be surprised when, in, you know, in a couple of years, you start to see these westernized uh, imams. As a matter of fact, in the United States, for example, after 9-11, that's precisely what happened. And in the Islamic world, this is kind of accepted as fact in, in the United yep. States that they right. start to collaborate more openly with the U.S. government yep. in order to be protected from the aftermath of 9-11 so that they don't end up being, you know, mistreated in the United States. Yeah, I covered this uh, more recently for those that follow my channel in my lectures on the history of the Fabian Society, and they were openly uh, some of the early proponents at the turn of the century, like the 1890s, last century, the ones that wanted to Im import uh, Islamic theology and philosophy. They're the ones that got it rolling at Oxford and Cambridge. They're the, they're the ones that invited uh, Sufis in to set up various uh, Islamic movements. So it started as a Sufi thing, and part of that had to do with the British imperial uh, strategy towards Islam as a whole, where, you know, they sort of divided up the, the Middle East and set up things like the Saudis and so forth with their spy networks. But uh, that's relevant because it speaks to David's point, which is that it's not like Islam was brought into the UK or the rest of Europe uh, to be friendly, to, to be nice, or because the, the elite behind this believe Islam. It's a tool. All it is is a tool. And like David's saying, that that based red pill attitude over time goes away because the people get turned into, uh, they get uh, processed by the native degenerate Western liberal culture that they're supposedly against. So it doesn't actually, it has a reverse effect. That, that's, that's yeah, yeah. I will part. say, I will say even hijab, for example, I mean, especially from a Turkish perspective, I mean, I, I, like he's, he basically said that. He, he said he called himself British, for example. I mean, I will say that's kind of like an example of that very, you know, liberal development, so to speak, where, I mean, um, 
I, and, and I think a lot of, you know, Muslim apologists and, and scholars and academics are kind of riding that kind of liberalism train because yeah. so far it's been going good for them. Right. Right. Exactly. It's been working for them. But, you know, people, especially here in Turkey, we kind of can see this being the case, which is why in, in dynamics here is a bit different because usually in the Islamic institution, there is no liberalism, but in the secular institutions, there's like full out, you know, complete overblown like campaign has already begun here in universities and academia and so on and so forth so um that process i think is you know is going to occur in the muslim communities in the west and i think again the united states has already fast processed that but really the rest of europe i think is going to catch up um eventually and that's when the real test because for example someone can ask well or the or, you know orthodoxy hasn't gone through that test actually we have gone through that test just look at the 1920s look at what happened in russia we have gone through the most severe for, form of that test and then look at you know orthodox christianity in russia is it in the super phase or anything like that no but it is certainly you know communism has been destroyed but orthodox christianity in, in russia still prevails that should tell you something very clearly so that's kind of like a proof. I haven't really seen that personally with, for example, Islam. And that's kind of what I want to see so that so we can see what's going on here. Well, and orthodoxy and the uh, other post-Soviet countries, right, um, as well. So, yeah, I, I think I, I think that's totally correct. I, I'd also like to say, um, just and this is kind of a, a just on the point of, you know, quote-unquote degeneracy, <clears throat> it's like I just, I don't understand how, well, it seems to me that a lot of stuff in islam like i'm not trying to be uncharitable but it seems like a lot of stuff just seems to be like if it gets a jurisprudential stamp then it can go from being something that's sinful to something that's permissible um like one for example is i, I don't know maybe there's an explanation for this i don't know but fornication for example you know uh, having sex outside of marriage is you know it's sinful but then if 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 the woman you're having you know sexual relations with is one of your slaves then all of a sudden it's like it's it's permissible i don't i don't, I don't understand that right it's it seems like it, it doesn't really make it kind of cheapens the notion of sin in the context of fornication um and i mean you could make an argument for wives but i think i think having slaves is probably a more a more obvious one right so for those that are curious about you know obviously the big hang-ups are the deity of christ and the trinity i'm putting uh the examples of two lengthy popular streams that I did on this topic. And so if you want more of that, you can get those um, unrelated to what Lewis is talking about. But I did want to, I did want to plug those streams because they do spend multiple hours covering the whole of uh, the old Testament, the new Testament, uh, looking at the deity of Christ and the Trinity, because those are always the big hangups. But then, then we do have to also kind of deal with these uh, so-called moral objections where there's this idea that, you know, Islam has this moral superiority and this, strength but it's not actually that when we look at what they actually teach and what they actually say um kai lewis uh, is there anything else you guys want to uh leave us with as we get to the super chats uh yeah one of the reasons i sure. haven't, got, haven't got my camera on is because i like to pace around uh when i do these round tables so yeah kai yeah, I think david people have been asking about it in the chat <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm okay. I think we've touched upon all the points. At least I've touched upon all the ones that I wanted to talk about. So David, good. <clears throat> David. Yeah, I I think I covered pretty much a lot of it. I mean, um, of course, I will. In in terms of one of the main things that I can anticipate from a lot of people is, oh, you you guys didn't talk about Christology, you didn't talk about Trinity, you didn't talk about the arguments as well. I mean. If you look at our channel for five seconds, or, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Shahada, or my <laughs> channel, or Jay's channel, that's nearly all we do. Right. So um, I think uh, if you're kind of interested in that aspect, where we go very in depth in, ex in explaining, Jay, particularly from both the patristic and the scriptural point of view, and I like to focus on more so the patristic historical point of view, and Orthodox Shahada likes to go at it from the more so, you know, counter Islamic point of view, I think we have various different videos where we talk about the trinity uh, how the trinity is one god uh, how we understand how we worship the father son and holy spirit as one god and what are what are our arguments both from scripture and from you know theology or one can even say philosophy and why we believe in these things and this is 
available in all of our channels. So of course, I'm going to say, you know, feel free to come see my channel and see what we talk about um, to kind of get uh, better access in those argumentations. Uh, one last thing for Jay. Yeah. Can you uh, go to minute mark one eight min uh, one hour eight minutes and thirteen seconds on the video I posted in the Discord? Because this is just the last thing about uh, your stand. Your uh, still uh, standing debate challenge to uh, Muhammad Hijab, which uh, got what was it? Several hundred. Re we retweets and then uh yeah it had like hundreds of retweets and at least five or six hundred likes um and so i've got the video pulled up so go to what what timestamp? one hour eight minutes 13 seconds and you want me to play that yeah okay here we go is, is interacting with this uh, other intelligent person that's creating this intelligent atmosphere and they're all this all these intelligent people are together so two things which are good having clever friends Clever friends and teachers, yeah, and uh, and clever and, and strong enemies, or strong. Let's just say strong op opponents. Without, without, I'll be honest with you. One, one of this is aside the point. You know who it is, but one of the ex-Muslims, uh, you know, anti-Muslims and stuff like that. I a private messaged him. I don't. I never show my private messages. And I said to him, "Listen, I, you know, yeah, I said." I said, why don't you go and do some Arabic studies and Islamic studies? And he said, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean by that? I said, back in the days, the Orientalists, 100 years ago, they were very formidable. They knew the Arabic, they, were, they knew Arabic poetry. We have, we have books here of Orientalists that they would look into history. I would be quivering and shaking and fear in fear and trepidation if I had to present against someone who was my superior in knowledge like that. I would, but, that would, but that would increase me, that would strengthen me, that would sharpen me. That would make me something into something different. But you have ruined me. <laughs> because because you have... You are, no, honestly. <laughs> because you are such an easy opponent, an unformidable opponent, unworthy opponent. That, <laughs> that, that you have not challenged me to, to go to the next level. It's not fair. We, any enemies of Islam, and Ibn Qayyim mentions him, Shafi, uh, al -Alil, he says that, you know, when you have like the devil or something, a formidable opponent, <laughs> let me fight something good, man. Uh, Tyson Fury can never really be one of the greats, not because he doesn't have the skill, but he doesn't have the opponents. And maybe he doesn't have the skill either, but he will never be compared with Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson. It's never going to happen. Because if, why is Mike Tyson in the conversation the best of all time? Because he's beaten so many good opponents. Top guys. We need opponents, but we need to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, don't be. Yeah, and two things in, from this from this story that we're looking at that we can look at is just guys that can help us to get to the next level, share ideas, sharpen the sword, metaphorically, obviously, just in case. And also, and opponents who can also challenge us, bring us to the next level. Because as as human beings, like Michael Jordan, I don't know how we're going from <laughs> Ashalism to Michael Jordan. What? I think you can stop it here, anyway. He was saying like, yeah, and so again, you know, clearly he saw the open invitation that we did well a year ago, and and he ignored all that. And then somebody sent me tweets uh, that was somebody's DMs about mentioning me, and that that they didn't feel like it would be good to actually debate me because it would be uh, too too much of a challenge. I don't remember which Muslim apologist that was. But... <clears throat> so that was Daniel Hakikachu. Okay, uh, he said that uh, yeah. you have to be careful who he debates and stuff like that. But yeah, but yeah my claim is just like Jay is superior to Muhammad Hijab in philosophy. So why don't Muhammad Hijab and Jay have a debate and then uh, Muhammad Hijab can be sharpened <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was by point, Jay's right? philosophical, uh, you know? Or he can ignore, you know, the hundreds of uh, reshares and likes, so. Yeah. Well, he's implying that, that he has that, no that, good opponents. It's crazy. Yeah, oh yeah, he's saying, yeah, well, there is nobody, yeah. Yeah, no, that clip is only from like maybe two, three months ago. It's a very recent, recent clip. So, well, you'll notice a lot of these people would just pretend that we don't exist, right? We, I'm uh, just uh, two, three thousand shy of a hundred thousand, uh, but no, we don't even exist. We've debated Dr. Spira Lee, Azra Rashid, but nobody even knows that we're here. So they're just pretending that they don't. Yeah, know that's the interesting thing is that you had debated people that are much better than he is in, yeah. in nearly every single capacity. And so if he wants to be sharpened, as he claims, rhetorically, of course, uh, then 
you know, he, there's no reason for him to deny that, that, that challenge. But I, I think one thing I remembered from that correspondence that you're referring to with Hakikotru is that he also said that we need to be careful who we select as an opponent as to not decrease the iman, that is the belief of the people watching it. So at one hand, you have, you have Hijab saying, I want stronger opponents. Now, now we see the reality of this. He wants stronger opponents. He's, he claims that he wants stronger opponents to increase the iman. And Hakikachu is basically showing the reality that actually, you know, if you give too strong of an opponent and he defeats the job, that's going to look bad for us. And we don't want to have that, right? And, and, you know, Peterson talked about the open exchange of ideas. And I think part of the open exchange of ideas is that you don't resort to things like that. that you're willing, if you're going to be a participant in the open exchange of ideas, so to speak, then you shouldn't be running away from a debate. You shouldn't be using these tactics. You shouldn't be talking about this will increase or decrease the iman. For example, for Pe like imagine Peterson saying, I can't get into that debate. That will in decrease the belief my followers have in me. Like that will be so dumb of him to say, right? That will look crazy on him and that will make him look disingenuous. And so I think if you're going to be participating in this rhetoric of you know, open dialogue, then you should be like Peterson in that sense and not be afraid to debate anyone, including those who are in every single capacity, much better and more intelligent than you on this given topic. And when I'm saying that, I'm, yeah. I'm also referring to the opponents that Jay debated as well. You know, um, these, these are the giants of contemporary Islam yeah, let's that was get, dealt with. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Good comments, David. Uh, all right, let's get to the super chats if you guys don't have anything else. And... Uh... I would remind you too, if you want to support my work, you can go to my website. There is a shop. You can get signed copies of my books. Uh, this one is the Red Book, as well as the Meta Narratives book, which is Introduction to Philosophy. The Red Book is, of course, all of the essays that I've written in philosophy and theology <coughs> over the last 10 years. They're uh, 660 pages, um, all signed copies when you get them on the website. There's also Jamie's books. There's also my uh, Hollywood books. And so you can support me that way. You can follow me also on my Rockfin channel, which uh, has a lot of unique content. My website, you can subscribe to that, which has uh, a paywall, has a, a years and years and years of archived lectures on geopolitics, philosophy, film, theology, etc. All of those things are available at my website as well. And uh, let's get to the super chats. First one is Mean Ninja, $10. Can you please do AJ regretfully ordering McDonald's in a drive-thru? Folks, this is unbelievable. I am here first thing in the morning, and they will not take my money. I have been de-McDonald. Folks, unbelievable. How's that? Ten bucks gets you that. Mean Ninja's ten dollars. Can you do an impersonation of me doing a speech at a Funko Pop convention because he was paid $10,000? Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, sadly, I am promoting Funko Pops, but I do have to be honest that I'm only doing it for the $10,000. How's that? Mean Ninja's $10. What if I believe in Islam because I want 72 virgins? Well, I think that those kinds of our, uh, uh, presentations are kind of like obvious kind of indicators that this is a religion that's kind of low tier, that's always a, uh, to sort of appealed on these kind of crass bases. Uh, so I actually think that would be um, I, I like when people bring that up because it's like, does, doesn't it look obvious that that's like a, a manipulation tactic, right? To get people to, to believe, um, mean ninjas again, $5 Christianity is polytheism because one, one, one is three. Um, no, actually Islam has similar problems or difficulties. Anytime you have multiple predicates of a, of a thing, of a God, of a deity, or even an object, you have to explain how there's a real multiplicity and in what sense. And so when we have doctrines like Tawheed and then other things like Tanzi, which is that uh, Islam, Allah is nothing like anything in the created order, then they have the same problem, but they want to excuse themselves from the problem, which they actually have a contradiction because they don't believe that Allah is analogical to anything in the created order. And yet they want to use a lot of analogical predication when it comes to mercy, just etc so they don't escape the problem that they try to put the christian in but the christian doesn't believe that god is strictly one god has multiple there's different ways in which he's multiple so there's there's different attributes that are multiple there are different actions and thoughts of god those are also really, really multiple the logi there's multiple persons there's also a unity there in terms of origin in the father and in terms of the nature that's communicated so 
Um, this is a low level critique that no Unitarian position escapes uh, just being quote Unitarian. Meta Ninja's $1. Can you do a stream on the divine feminine? Have you done one? No, I don't believe in a divine feminine um, unless you mean sort of references perhaps typologically to the Virgin Mary or the Theotokos as the queen of heaven. Jmel $40. How do Muslims, and I'm going to let you guys answer too if there's any questions that come up relevant to you. Feel free to chime in if you think I've um, missed something or you want to you want to say something. How does, is by the way, guys, I will be sharing the super chats with... Uh, uh, with uh, David and Lewis and Kai. So it's not just coming to me. We're going to split it. How do, uh, does the Islamic attitude about war and dimitude play out in the European no-go zone? Is this a, uh, is Europe, is a weak Europe in danger? What about in light of the energy crisis and inflation? How does, in other words, how does Islam and its uh, position in, in Europe fit with these crises is this something where islam is going to step to the fore and become more relevant in in your are we going to see more and more co converts to islam what do you guys think about that yeah i think the the dispute about the no go zones especially was something that was prevalent in 2015 uh that was that was a that was a serious time which is uh, again uh, the reason why i raised this point in the first place when i was talking about andrew tate is because he talked a lot about how London is a failed society and how the West is a failed society because there, there are no go zones, because there, are vi there is violence, because you can't just freely go anywhere. And now he, you know, part of that, like part of the ignition of that being caused, that, the, the no go zones and such, uh, he has suddenly now adopted that, which to me sounds very contradictory. Um, and, and the reason, like to me, this is not even an argument against Islam. This is rather an argument against the way of his thinking, because one thing that's very clear if you listen to a couple of clips of his is that even when it comes to religion, it's a very materialistic point of view. It's like, how do, you know, oh, these people are like this. That's why I like it. Uh, they do this. That's cool. Or, you know, what's important in life is making a lot of money, being successful, you know, having a lot of women, having a multitude of women which he actually proclaims openly um, to be something positive, um, you know, polygamy and such. Although, you know, there were times where he was, you know, shifty on that, where he kind of was like, well, actually monogamy is better and all this kind of stuff. But I think uh, that's going to stop, that rhetoric is going to stop now, especially with the four wise discourse and all of that. So uh, it's, 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 it has been calmed down, at least from what I've seen as someone from the outside, of how it's happening in Europe in terms of the energy crisis and how it's going to affect Islam, I don't think it has really much to do with that anymore. I think the the discourse of you know the immigration crisis and all of that kind of stuff in Europe has already. I think that discourse is already finished. The effects of it is now something that's occurring right now. Is basically is what <coughs> what my take is. Anybody else want to move on? Benjamin VP, $10. You and Pajot have been drawing me towards orthodoxy in the last year. I just had my first child. My wife and I are starting to be uh, the catechumenate next week. We uh, will all be baptized uh, when, my tr when my son becomes one. Uh, praise be to God. Thank you, Jay. Well, glad to hear that, Benjamin uh, VP. God bless you for that. Joshua Sun Sunza, $5. Good, dis d good discussion. Thank you, Joshua. Duke of Earl. Thank you, chaps. Thank you, Duke of Earl. Nada, $10. It's important to highlight that Islam relabeled immorality and made it halal. Uh, just to highlight a few examples, prostitution, sexual slavery, multiple wives. Uh, you can uh, beat them. Prepossessant wives are permissible. Therefore, Islam is pious. Yeah, the, the, the idea of the, the, the based uh, kind of uh, evolves over time. <laughs> That's the point. Is it really based if it's a thing that can change? JML, $10. This seems to be marketing, not converting. Roosh was a pickup artist and very different attitudes when he changed his, uh, when he became Orthodox. Yeah, I think Lewis made that point as well, J. Mel. Not a $10. Muhammad Hijab encouraged Ridvan to kill himself because of his bouts with anxiety and depression. That could have been just as easily directed at Jordan Peterson, who also has had bouts with uh, depression. I wonder if Jordan Peterson is aware that he show showcased a guy who promotes suicide. Interesting question. I don't know. 
J. Mel, $10. Rich Higgins explained that Muslim influence towards political correctness in American national security uh, is outlined in his book called The Memo. Rich Higgins, The Memo. I'm not familiar with that, but thank you for that. Uh, Ellie Orthodox, $5. Jay, thank you for showing the baby pandas so much love. Oh, this is a meme somebody made. So yeah, I, I fed baby pandas uh, in a meme, and so now I'm not mean anymore. So the internet thinks I'm mean, but uh, if I feed a baby panda, then I'm good. Carbohydrate Lofton, $10. Can we hear a John Hagee impression? Please don't listen to anything that Michael Lofton says. The blood moons have told me that Michael Lofton is a liar and a fraud. How's that? John Hagee commenting on Carbohydrate Lofton. The Palantir, $3. How do you feel about the apologetic work of David Wood? I've never talked to David Wood. Uh, I've done interviews with Sam Shamoon. I know Sam Shamoon is friends with David Wood, but um, I think that he comes from an evangelical sort of Protestant view, so I'm sure he has a lot of good insights and arguments, but um, I'm not really, I don't really follow his content. Does anybody else have any com comments on David Wood? All I'm going to say is, the decision to delete the channel and go back to YouTube is someone they not is a not so intelligent decision. Is that all? That's all. That's the only thing I have in mind. Kai Lewis, anything you guys want to comment on any of the uh, super chat so far, or you want me to keep going? Are you still there? No, you can keep going. Okay. A non three dollars. Do you think orthodoxy will end up being severely infiltrated and corrupted? Uh, and liberalized like Catholicism and Protestantism. Seems like some of the OCA has been marching towards uh, liberalism. I'm afraid we will have a Francis. Well, we don't have a Pope, so there won't be the problem like Francis, but certainly any jurisdiction can uh, and be is susceptible to modernism and liberalism. So it's definitely possible. And yeah, you can always have more liberalism, but you know we believe in the promise of Matthew uh, 16 that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So I don't think... Even though you can have a large apostasy, you're not going to have all the bishops in the world, you know, apostatizing. Greek Groper, $3. Good show, Jay. I have been a Christian for many years. I can sympathize with people who look at other religions for uh, traditions and spirituality, searching, etc. It's difficult for a right-wing person to become a Christian when they see Francis, clown masses, and Skittles. Yeah, uh, precisely. I couldn't agree more. Storm the Cat, $5. What language did Noah speak? Um, I don't know, and I don't think we know. So the story of Noah is a tradition that's recounted and recorded uh, at the time of Moses. So I don't know that we know exactly what that language was like. Um, there's probably scholarly speculation, but we're not told. Um, anybody else, if you want to uh, throw in a super chat there, I'm going to let everybody promote their channels. Of course, uh, Lewis and Kai, you want to tell us again about your channel because people might be tuning in late what you guys cover, and then David, your channel, and you guys are both linked in the show description. Be sure and follow these guys. Thanks to Chase, uh, who has been promoting their channels throughout the whole live stream. We got up to almost a 1,000 live viewers today, so that was a, it was a great show. Um, Kai Lewis, tell us about your channel and what you guys focus on. Yeah, so Kai, that's me and Lewis. Um, we're the two that run Orthodox Shahada, basically looking at Islam from Orthodox, from an Orthodox perspective. Um, we look at the philosophy, the metaphysics, um, ethics, morality. Um, we look at the fiqh. We look at hadiths. We look at the history. We look at all sorts of things that are relevant to um, making a case for Orthodoxy against Islam. David? So... Hello, this is me, David Adhan, the guy who's been annoying you with my voice and my accent. If you want to see, if you want to be annoyed more with my terrible English and my terrible comprehension skills, I'm just being, I'm just being, I'm just trying to, uh, well, my channel is David Adhan. It used to be, I used to go by The Real Medvite. And as I said at the start of the stream, what I generally deal with in my channel is particularly the 4th and 7th century patristic Christian theology, uh, dealing with various different issues that was the, that's historically that many people have forgotten today, but also are, it's also important with some contemporary issues. So I make videos about the filioque, I make videos about Christology, uh, one of my most popular playlists and series is the uh, Oriental Orthodox Refuted playlist, where I've died, I've 
I delve very deep into the primary sources to explain the Christology of uh, what is known today as the Oriental Orthodox and many other videos about Orthodox theology, many other videos about, you know, uh, certain books, whether those books are from secondary scholars or whether from primary sources themselves, from the church fathers themselves. And sometimes occasionally I make videos where I talk about politics, but especially seeing as how things are the way they are in YouTube, it's pretty much more difficult to talk about that kind of stuff. So I've, I like to play it safe and I like to play, uh, I like to talk about what I personally am addicted about, which is about Christian theology. So if you want to see more of that, and if you want to see kind of what the fathers say and deep discussions on key topics in Christianity that has a catechetical purpose for the purpose of, you know, helping you learn about the faith, then my channel might just be what you need in your life. So I will definitely recommend you check me out and thank you all for listening to us. Yeah, and by the way, I did just remember uh, the scholarly consensus is that the language that Noah spoke was pigeon, which is a form of ebonics. So I'm pretty sure that's right. The Palantir three dollars. I believe Jordan Peterson struggles with the historical understanding of Scripture, and this might be because he's very much influenced by Carl Jung. I think you're very perceptive there. I think that's probably correct. Um, certainly, Carl Jung has some insights, but we know Carl Jung is very influenced by Gnosticism. Uh, so you know that's going to be definitely a hang up. Um, Anyway, uh, all right. Thank you guys so much. If you would hit like and share, leave some comments below as to what you think we left out. Other important sections of the discussions with Tate or with Peterson and Hijab that we missed. Tell me down below in the comments what you think we missed or any good arguments that we, you think uh, that we missed. Otherwise, uh, everybody.